We're going to call today's meeting to order. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our Forward Pinellas board meeting for March. We have board members here in the room, but some of our staff, presenters, and members of the public will be joining us via Zoom today. So at this time, if those in the room would please stand for the invocation and pledge, Commissioner Eggers will give the invocation and lead the pledge. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father and God, we are so fortunate to live in this wonderful country, state, and county. We thank you for the many blessings you have given to each of us individually and collectively as residents of Pinellas County. We thank you for the development of a vaccine and for those who are administering the process and the vaccines. We ask that you watch over those who have lost, who have lost loved ones and who are dealing with the many emotional and mental side effects of isolation. We also ask that you help our people gain confidence to reach a state of calm and patience with each other as we re-enter at different paces and levels of acceptance. We also thank you for our amazing government public servants throughout the county and our cities that have been working their jobs and more in an effort to serve the residents of Pinellas County. Today I ask that you be with us as we do the business of Forward Pinellas on behalf of our residents. Especially we thank you for the consummate professionals here at Forward Pinellas. They truly embody what is good about our residents and public service. We ask all of this and our own personal intentions in your most precious name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner Eggers, if you could just introduce yourself real yeah, quick before yeah, you yeah. Uh, leave. Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commissioner. Cliff Murs, Vice Mayor, City of Safety Harbor, representing the cities of Safety Harbor, Oldsmar, and Tarpon Springs. Brandy Gabbard, City of St. Petersburg. Karen Seal, Pinellas County Commission. Bonnie Noble, Inland Communities. Janet Long, Pinellas County Commissioner, District 1. Pat Gerard, Pinellas County Commission, District 2. Michael Smith, uh, Commissioner, City of Largo. Cookie Kennedy, Mayor of the City of Indian Rocks Beach, representing, let's see if I can do this, Treasure <laughs> Island, St. Pete Beach, Madeira Beach, Indian Shores, Indian Rocks, Bel Air Beach, Bel Air Shores, Reddington Shores, Reddington Beach, and North Reddington. Did I miss anybody? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I hope not. Anyway, thank you. I'm Whit Bland, the Executive Director. And I'm Darden Rice, your chair. Before we move on with the agenda, we're, we're going to have our process coordinator, Tina Javelin, outline the procedures that will be followed for public comment today. Um, Tina, would you please state uh, the procedures? Thank you. I'll take the next few minutes to review the process that has been devised for this meeting. There will be a technology moderator and a process coordinator who will be tasked with facilitating the in-person and Zoom portions of the meeting. The technology moderator will be Sarah Caper, Principal Planner with Forward Pinellas, and she will be facilitating the Zoom portions of the meeting. The process coordinator will be myself, Tina Jablon, Executive Administrative Secretary for Forward Pinellas, and I will be facilitating the in-person portions of the meeting. Any person may be heard by the Forward Pinellas Board for not more than three minutes on any proposition before the board unless such time is modified by the chair. The options and methods for doing that will be explained in a moment. To ensure an accurate record of the meeting, when addressing the board, the speaker must first state and spell his or her name, state their address, and announce what agenda item they will be speaking to. Throughout the meeting, we ask that all presenters and commenters identify themselves by name each time they speak unless they have been introduced or specifically called on by name. Additionally, please be mindful of not speaking over one another. Prior to a vote on any matter, the chair will seek public comment. 
The chair will inquire of the technology moderator in Zoom to see if there are members of the public wishing to address the board. The technology moderator will ask for a virtual hand raising of all those in Zoom wishing to speak on an item. The number of people in the room and with their hand raised in Zoom will be noted and reported to the chair. Each person will be given three minutes to address the board or time as modified by the chair for all speakers. Those present in the room will speak first, followed by those in Zoom. Finally, the chair may seek more information from forward Pinellas staff, the presenter, or other sources before entertaining a motion and a vote. The majority of forward Pinellas staff and presenters will be participating via Zoom. We ask that everyone please silence all their cell phones and noise-making devices, and we ask that we allow presentations to be completed in their entirety before providing comments or asking questions. And with that, Councilmember Rice, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Tina. Um, we're gonna begin with citizens to be heard. Um, if there's any citizens wishing to be heard on any items not already on the agenda for action by the board today, Tina, are there any members of the public in the room who wish to speak? And again, this is for items not already on the agenda. No, ma'am. Everyone that has indicated they wish to speak today has referenced a particular item on the agenda. Okay, thank you. And Sarah, are there any members of the public in Zoom? Any who members of the public in Zoom wishing to address the board on this item, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, or if you're calling in, press star nine on the phone. There's nobody with, oh, there is one hand raised. It is a call-in number ending in nine eight. I'm going to allow you to speak at this time. You should be able to unmute yourself and speak. Hi, my name is Casey Crane. I live at 6301 26th Avenue North in St. Petersburg, and I'm calling with regard to the Flume 60 project. Um, I actually sent emails to everybody, but I wasn't sure if they would be counted in in time, and I'm here to address my concerns regarding the project and firmly stand against it along with hundreds of other citizens within the city, particularly in the neighborhoods surrounding the project. Thank you. Um, um, I would ask that you please provide your comments uh, during that agenda item. This is for items, uh, unless Chair Rice, you'd like to continue because we don't have anyone else speaking on this. Um, if it's okay with legal, um, I'll let her continue to speak since she's already begun and um, uh, allow this to proceed. Okay, my apologies for coming in at the wrong time. I thought it was just, I've never done this before, so I thought it was to be part of the, the general discussion. Um, but my concerns basically are revolving the toxin levels within the ground surrounding the property, um, which has been you know, voiced decades ago that it should not be built upon for decades more to come, yet we're trying to build a lagoon, we're trying to build residences and things like that where people are going to be continuously in that area and it's going to affect not only the people in the new development, it would affect the surrounding neighborhoods. Other concerns would be we don't have the road infrastructure to build such a complex. Um, I don't see how they would expand the road infrastructure except for maybe 66th Street, but no other roads can be expanded. We don't have the water system or wastewater support to support this kind of project. We have already pumped how many gallons of water, wastewater into Tampa Bay on multiple occasions because of our current wastewater infrastructure deficits. Um, other concerns as well relate to the increase in noise pollution, actual pollution from all of the different traffic, as well as the chemicals that would be put into the air that people will be breathing in around that site, as well as certain neighborhoods that the chemicals would be carried through the air and would be affected by. So there are a lot of different concerns, not even to mention, you know, the cost of such a project in terms of the police force that will have to respond to any and all incidences um, at this complex since they don't have their own security planned for. That's gonna take away from all of us within surrounding neighborhoods and other areas of, of the city as well. Um, so these are just a few of the concerns that come into play here. Um, but I just wanna make sure that every single council member is considering these concerns. As a homeowner in the area, you know, I've invested my, my savings into building equity within my home, and I'm concerned about 
home values dropping, crime levels increasing, and everything else surrounding it. If you look at the areas surrounding places like Bush Gardens, Adventure Island, on those kind of properties, the home values have gone down in terms of the general um, vicinity of the homes in comparison to other areas that are not surrounding those areas. High crime rates, those kind of concerns. So I just want to make sure that people are considering this before they put anything to a vote or plan to move forward with it. So thank you for your time. Okay. Um, thank you for those comments. And Ms. Crane, just um, please know that your email was received and distributed to all board members today and are at our desk. So thank you. Um, thank you kindly. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move on to uh, number four, recognitions and announcements. Uh, I'd like to introduce Angela Ryan of our Forward Pinellas staff for a brief presentation to recognize Florida Bicycle Month and the virtual Bike Your City for 2021. Hi, Angela. Hello, thank you so much, Chair, and good afternoon, board. First, I would like to draw attention to the Bike Month proclamation in everyone's agenda packet today. And as I'm sure you're aware, uh, Florida is, um, excuse me, March is Florida Bike Month. And this proclamation is for the Ford Pinellas Board to reaffirm Bicycle Month in Pinellas County. And second, I'm going to provide a short presentation on our Bike Your City event. And we have a planned a very exciting and um, well attended uh, Bike Your City scavenger hunt for the entire month of March. We already have 792 people signed up and the event does go till uh, March 31st. And essentially the, the, prod, the scavenger hunt includes people finding transportation related treasures, as we have called them, within their own neighborhood that provide education on things like rectang rectangular rapid flashing beacons, which are really important safety enhancements along our roadway. And trying to go to the next slide, I'm sorry. There we are. The real purpose of the Bike Your City event, in addition to celebrating the month, is really to provide safety information to the public. Like I've already indicated, we have already almost 800 people that have received the Bike Your City Scavenger Hunt information. And that includes these simple to understand yet really important safety um, graphics that you can see here on the screen that can help people stay safe while they're walking and while they're biking within their communities at all times throughout the year. Additionally, I'm very pleased to announce that we have partnered with the Safety Harbor Art and Music Center who is kindly creating 100 custom bike yard signs that we will be giving out the last two Saturdays of March. The bike signs do have the Safe Streets Pinellas logo as well as the Ford Pinellas logo. So these can be used throughout the entire year to promote safety on our roads. And another element of our bike month celebration is really targeted to non-cyclists. It's targeted to motorists and other people that won't take place in the scavenger hunt event. And it's a Tuesday trivia where we have specific questions that are targeted towards active transportation and safe streets Pinellas that we ask the, pu the public to answer. And if they answer correctly, they have the opportunity to win a gift basket, which has bicycle gift, gift certificates, t-shirts, bike lights, and a lot of other fun promotional items. And lastly, I just want to thank our partners. This is, this is already a great success. And uh, Pinellas County has kindly partnered with us for this project, as well as all these other uh, wonderful um, companies and organizations that are on this slide here. And um, to conclude my presentation, Chair, I would just like to request that the board approve the Florida Bike Month um, uh, uh, affirmation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Angela. And I know I'm looking forward to taking part in this. Uh, it's really exciting, certainly the right thing for us to get behind. Um, this is an action item. So if I could uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve the proclamation affirming March as Florida Bicycle Month, please. Move approval. Second. Okay. Tina, did you get, did you get that? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
terrific. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Angela. Uh, moving on to our consent agenda. Um, I do want to make a note that we are going to pull 5B. That was included accidentally. Uh, that was something that we had already taken action on previously. Excuse me, Madam Chair, we're not pulling the entire item. We will still oh. have committee appointments. We will just not be making any appointments to the CAC as outlined in your agenda because that gentleman was actually appointed by action of this board last month. My apologies for the error. Oh, no problem, and thank you for the clarification. So we're, we're just pulling the CAC appointment from 5B. So with that, um, if there are any other changes or comments, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move no approval. Second. Okay. Excuse me, Chair, we need oh. to ask for public comment. Yes, Tina, is there anyone in the room who would like to comment on this item? No, there is not. Sarah, is there anyone in Zoom who would like to comment on this item? Anyone in Zoom wishing to comment on this item, please use the raised hand function in Zoom at this time or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. There's no one wishing to speak on this item. Okay. Madam Chair, I did not get the second, I'm sorry. I've, who was the second? Oh, it was uh, Mayor Kennedy. Okay. Okay, so we have the motion on the floor. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. That passes. Thank you very much. We are now going to move into the public hearing section of the agenda. Uh, we will first hear the MPO public hearings, followed by the PPC. So let's go to um, 6. A, proposed amendments to the fiscal year 2021 to fiscal year 2425 transportation improvement program. This item will be covered by Jensen Hackett, hello, of FDOT, who's in the room with us today. Um, thank you, Jensen, and please proceed. Perfect. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, board members. It's nice to see you all again. Uh, Jensen Hackett with the Department of Transportation. I will be going over project number 448852-1, which is to be amended into your transportation improvement program this afternoon. This project includes the purchase of two new electric buses and a new depot charging station for the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority. This project will allow PSTA to continue its electric bus expansion program and improve the safety and reliability of the system. The total cost of the amendment is just over $1.2 million, and this is coming from an FTA 5339 grant. This amendment does not affect any other projects that are currently within the Ford Pinellas TIP, and for this amendment, I will need a motion for approval and a subsequent vote, and as always, I can take any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you, Jensen. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Questions, comments? Okay, Tina, is there anyone in the room who would like to comment on this item? No, ma'am, there is not. And Sarah, are there any members of the public in Zoom who wish to speak to this proposed amendment? Anyone wishing to speak to this amendment in Zoom, please use the raise hand button in Zoom at this time or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. There is no one wishing to speak on this item. All right, thank you, Sarah. So the action item is for the board to approve uh, the TIP amendment. This is a roll call vote. Do I hear a motion and a second to approval. approve? Second. Great, so we have a motion and approval, and a motion and a second. Uh, Tina, could you please um, do the roll call? Mayor Bujalski? Aye. Commissioner Gerard? Aye. Vice Mayor Albritton? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Commissioner Eggers? Aye. Vice Mayor Mers? Yes. Council Member Gabbard? Yes. Commissioner Seal? Yes. Council Member Noble? Yes. Commissioner Long? Yes. And Council Member Rice? Yes. That carries unanimously. Great. 
Thank you very much. And really exciting to see PSTA continue its commitment to electric bus infrastructure. So thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna move to 6B. This is the Pinellas Planning Council section. Uh, we have four uh, countywide plan map amendments to discuss today. Um, I will first ask our forward Pinellas staff to present the items. Applicant local governments are available in Zoom and also here in the room for questions as needed. Once each presentation is given, I will then ask for the proponents of the proposal to speak, then opponents, and finally, any other citizens who wish to comment or ask questions on the case. We will then hear rebuttal by the applicant as necessary and a staff response or summary. At that time, the board will ask questions. I will close the public hearing and the board will deliberate and take action. So um, thank you for joining us today, Nusheen, and uh, who's with us today. And um, please begin with your presentation on case CW21-02 with the city of Tarpon Springs. Thank you, Chair Rice. Um, good afternoon to the members of the board. For the record, Nusheen Rahman with Ford Pinellas. Um, as Chair Rice mentioned, this is CW2102 submitted by the city of Tarpon Springs. Next slide, please. The city seeks to amend a property from the residential low medium category to the public semi-public category. And the purpose of this proposed amendment is to allow for the development of a public work slash public storage facility. Next slide. The subject property is located at the corner of Anclote Boulevard and LNR Industrial Boulevard with an area size of approximately 0.58 acres. It is currently vacant with surrounding uses including single family residential homes and commercial retail uses. Next slide. The following is an image of the front of the subject property. Next, please. Next, an image of the single family residential homes located to the north of the subject property. Next slide. And then similar uses located to the east of the subject property. Next slide. The map in front of you portrays the current countywide plan map category of residential low medium, along with the permitted uses for this category listed in front of you. Next slide. And also in front of you is the same map, but with the density and intensity standards of this category listed in front of you. As mentioned, the city intends to develop a public storage facility um, on this property, and this type of use falls under, under the definition of the transportation utility use. And this is not an allowable use under the corresponding local category of residential low medium, hence the proposed amendment to public semi-public. Next slide. And this proposed category is shown on this map in front of you along with its permitted uses. Next slide. And then we have the same map but the density and intensity standards of the public, semi-public category. Next slide. To conclude, this proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the public semi-public category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. Next slide. In front of you is an analysis of those relevant countywide considerations. Next slide, please. And lastly, there were no public comments for this case, concluding my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nusheen. Um, first, we will ask for any proponents wishing to be heard. Sarah, are there any proponents in the room or in Zoom who wish to speak? I see no proponents in the room. There is one person in Zoom with their hand raised. If there are any other proponents in Zoom, please use the raised hand button at this time or press star nine on the phone. Uh, the hand raised I see is Samsung SMN910V. I will allow you to speak at that time. Please state and spell your name and state your address and then you will have three minutes. You should be able to talk at this time. I looks like you're on mute. I will ask you to unmute.
the person in Zoom with your hand raised ending in 910V, if you could unmute yourself at this time. Chair, it looks like the individual is unable to unmute themselves. Is there any way to communicate with them otherwise? Is there any acknowledgement that we're trying to get them to unmute? Because if not, we'll just move on. I haven't seen anything. Um, okay. you, you could also, um, to the person raising their hand ending in 910V, if you would like to call in, the call in information is available on the Forward Pinellas website. And at this time, I'll ask you to unmute one more time and that isn't working so I can uh, lower their hand and disable the speaking. If, uh, if Chair, if you're okay moving on since yes. they're unable okay. to unmute. Okay, um, thank you, Sarah. Um, are there any opponents wishing to be heard? Sarah, are there any opponents in the room or in Zoom? There are no opponents in the room. Any opponents in Zoom, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom at this time or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. There are no opponents. Okay, thank you. And now I will inquire if there's any other citizens wishing to be heard. Sarah, are there any citizens in the room or in Zoom who wish to speak? There are no citizens in the room. Any citizens wishing to be heard in Zoom, please use the raise hand button in Zoom at this time or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. There is nobody wishing to speak at this time. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And with that, we will close the public hearing. And if the board has any questions or comments, uh, now is the time for, for us to do that. Uh, Council Commissioner Eggers. Uh, just, uh, I would like to make the motion, move approval. Okay, thank you. And I see we have a second from Commissioner Gerard. We have so we, a comment. So do we have another? Co oh, yes. I'm sorry, Vice Mayor uh, Cliff Mertz. Just, just a question. Um, on the staff analysis, it, it indicates that the property is 2.82 acres, but in the other detail, it's 0.58 acres. That's just a transcription difference, I presume. Yes, that would be a mistake if it says 2.82 anywhere. The correct acreage is 0 0.58. My apologies. No, no, no. I just wanted to make sure in case it, once it gets approved, it didn't have to come back or some delay because of that. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Seeing none, we have a motion on the floor. And um, could, we don't need to do a roll call vote for this. Okay. So all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, that passes unanimously. Uh, thank you very much. We'll move on to the next item. Uh, again, with Nusheen Rahman uh, presenting. This is 6B2 Case CW21-05 with the City of Clearwater. Thank you, Chair Rice. Um, as you mentioned, this is CW2105 submitted by the City of Clearwater. Next slide, please. The city seeks to amend a property from the residential medium and residential low medium categories all to the residential low medium category. And the purpose of this proposed amendment is to address a nonconformity with the existing mobile home park in, in addition to allow the redevelopment of an administrative office on the property into a clubhouse. Next slide. The subject property is located at 1280 and 1298 Lakeview Road with an area size of approximately nine acres. It is currently a mobile home park, as I mentioned previously, with surrounding uses, including retail and single-family residential homes. 
the following image is of the front of the subject property, um, taken specifically from the north on Jefford Street. The day that I happened to visit the site, Lakeview Road, the main road, happened to be closed. So all the images will be from Jefford Street instead. Next slide. Next, we have an image of the single family residential homes to the east of the subject property. Next slide. And lastly, we have images of more single family residential homes to the west of the subject property. Next slide, please. The map in front of you portrays the current countywide plan map categories of residential medium and residential low medium. As you can see, the majority of the property is designated residential medium, and this is the um, vast majority of the mobile home park with residential low medium applying to what is now the administrative office. And also in front of you, you have the permitted uses for the RLM category. Next slide, please. Next, we have the density and intensity standards for the residential medium category. Next slide, please. And then we have the permitted uses for the residential low medium category. Next slide, please. And lastly, the density and intensity standards for the residential low medium category. Um, as I mentioned, this application was submitted due to a nonconformity at the city level. The mobile home park use is not permissible under the local residential medium category, but it is allowed under our countywide plan map category. But since there's a nonconformity at the city level, the applicant has proposed to amend this to the correct local category, which corresponds to our residential low medium category. Next slide, please. And this can be seen on the map in front of you, which shows the entire property being designated to residential low medium. And again, you have the permitted uses for the residential low medium category. Next slide, please. And again, the density and intensity standards for the residential low medium category. Next slide, please. To conclude, this proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the residential low medium category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. Next slide. Again, in front of you is an analysis of those relevant countywide considerations. Next slide, please. And lastly, there were no public comments received for this case, concluding this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nusheen. So, Sarah, um, are there any proponents in the room or in Zoom who wish to speak? This is the time for proponents wishing to be heard. We have one proponent in the room. Any proponents in Zoom, please use the raised hand feature or star nine on the phone at this time. The proponent in the room is Brian Unst. Madam Chair, Mr. Unst has indicated to me that he only needs to speak to the board if there are questions that he needs to address for you all on this item. Okay, thank you. Um, there are no other proponents then. Okay, thank you. Um, if, if, if someone does have questions for Mr. Unks, does that have to take place during the public he hearing or can that ha happen after we close the public hearing too? That will be during the public hearing, ma'am. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so now's the time to hear from any opponents wishing to be heard. Sarah, are there any opponents either in the room or in Zoom who wish to speak? There are no opponents in the room. Any opponents in Zoom, please use the raise hand button or press star nine on the phone at this time. There are no opponents. Okay, thank you. And now is the time for any other citizens wishing to be heard. Sarah, are there any other citizens either in the room or in Zoom who wish to speak? Any citizens wishing to be heard in Zoom, please use the raise hand button feature at this time or press star nine on the phone. There are no other citizens wishing to be heard on this item in the room or in Zoom. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that will close the public hearing. Um, now it goes to board discussion. Uh, do we have any board comments, questions? If not, do I hear a, a motion for approval or denial? Move to approve case CW2105. Okay. Second. Thank you. That was a motion from Vice Mayor Albritton and a second, I believe, from Commissioner Smith. Yes. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Great, that's unanimous. And we will move on to our next item. Uh, thank you again, Nusheen. Uh, this is item 6B3, case CW21-06, City of St. Petersburg. Thank you, Chair Rice. Um, this next case I'll be presenting is going to be presented somewhat differently from typical land use presentations as there are multiple impacted countywide considerations to go over in more critical detail. But first, I'll start with the usual general information. Next slide, please. The city seeks to amend a property from the employment and target employment center categories to the multimodal corridor category while keeping the target employment center category or overlay on this property. The applicant is requesting the proposed amendment in order to develop a sports tourism facility with a public lagoon and beach area and a multifamily residential building. Next slide, please. The subject property is located at 1501 72nd Street North with an area size of approximately 29.11 acres. It is currently vacant with surrounding uses including residential, recreation, open space, commercial, and other manufacturing and industrial uses. Next slide, please. This case is very unique and requires some context setting and you might know of the subject property colloquially as the Raytheon property. And previously the subject property was the site of a research and laboratory facility for a defense electronics company known as E-Systems Incorporated. However, after soil and groundwater contamination was discovered on the property in 1991, the Raytheon company acquired this property in 1995 and installed testing wells on it in 1996. After installation of these testing wells, the company found that the polluted groundwater had migrated into areas outside of the subject property, and subsequently a water treatment facility was constructed to the south of the subject property. And it should be noted that this water treatment facility is not actually part of the amendment area. It will remain under the employment designation. Next slide, please. The following is an image of the front of the subject property taken from 70 Strecken Street North. Next slide, please. Next, we have the image of the aforementioned water treatment facility to the south of the subject property. Next slide, please. Then we have some of the single family residential homes located to the south of the subject property. Next slide, please. Next, we have images of Azalea Park, which is located adjacent to the west of the subject property. Next slide, please. And lastly, we have an image of the commercial area to the north of the subject property, which is generally known as the Tyrone Industrial Park area. Next slide, please. The map in front of you portrays the current countywide plan map category of employment, along with its permitted uses listed in front of you. Um, of note in this slide um, are the permitted uses, which are subject to a five acre maximum. You will see the commercial recreation is listed on, under this use. Um, and this has a bearing on this amendment that I'll come back to later. Next slide, please. Next, we have the density and intensity standards of the employment category. And as mentioned, the primary proposed use of this amendment is a sports tourism facility, and this falls under the definition of a commercial recreation use. And as you saw a moment ago on the previous slide, the commercial recreation use is limited to an acreage of five acres. And because this subject property exceeds this size, the applicant is proposing an amendment to the multimodal corridor category. Next slide, please. This category is shown on the following slide with the permitted uses and density and intensity standards listed in front of you. And something that's unique about the multimodal corridor category is that the permitted uses are determined by the applicant local government's regulations, which are pursuant to some standards outlined in the countywide rules. But because of this, it is necessary for us to discuss the local zoning regulations and standards in this case, as they have implications for the uses allowed in this amendment. Next slide, please. So this proposed amendment corresponds to the city's um, com corridor commercial suburban zoning category or CCS1. And the permitted uses for this category are listed on the table in front of you. The city's staff report indicates that most employment uses um, allowed under the employment category will continue to be allowed under the proposed zoning category. And while this is true, this case is nuanced in that the applicant has entered into a development agreement with the city, which actually limits the use of the property to the following uses, a 150 square foot minimum sports tourism facility and ancillary retail and restaurant uses, a public lagoon with a beach area, and a multifamily building with a minimum of 30% of the units designated as workforce housing. 
Therefore, it is important to note that while those employment uses are allowable by right under the proposed category, this proposed amendment specifically is not able to provide for the same range of uses due to the constraints of the development agreement. And this brings us to the countywide considerations that we must critically evaluate in a case like this. Next slide, please. This next slide shows the usual countywide considerations that all land use cases are evaluated against. And as you're all aware, we have a vested interest in reserving employment and industrial designated lands in our county for economic vitality and the preservation and creation of jobs that are considered target employment opportunities. This proposed amendment raises concerns with this as it converts away from the employment category. And as such, I will be discussing the two highlighted considerations in front of you in more detail. Next slide, please. The first countywide consideration evaluates the consistency of the proposed amendment with the countywide rules. And as mentioned, this proposed amendment falls under the definition of commercial recreation as outlined by the rules. And while this may be consistent with the multimodal corridor category, because the proposed amendment will be maintaining the target employment center overlay, this proposed amendment must also be evaluated against the requirements of the TEC category. And the locational characteristics of the TEC category focuses on providing for target employment opportunities, which are those employers and industries paying above average wages and producing goods and services for the sale and consumption that import revenue to the community. And sports tourism does not meet this definition of target employment outlined in the countywide rules. I'll discuss this in more detail in the next countywide consideration. But for the purpose of this consideration, this proposed amendment is not consistent with the locational characteristics of the target employment center category. Next slide, please. The seventh countywide consideration is concerned with the, uh, with the reservation of industrial land, which includes the target employment center and employment categories. And the countywide rules state that amendments that proposed to convert away from this category must balance against a set of five criteria and I'll be going over these criteria one by one with you today. This first criteria involves the extent to which the proposed amendment can potentially provide for target employment opportunities as compared to those that could potentially be available. Target employment opportunities are defined as high wage primary employment, including but not limited to those fields listed on the second bullet point in front of you. And while this definition does indicate that these fields are not limited, these are the desired types of target industries as it stands, and sports tourism is not consistent with this definition. Another factor to consider with this definition is the concept of wages, as target employment requires high wages, and additionally, the target employment center category focuses on employers and industries paying above average wages. The average annual wage of our county, as identified by Pinellas County Economic Development, is annually at $48,901. Based on materials provided by the applicant, the aggregate payroll estimate of this proposed use is expected to be $2.3 million for an employment potential of 81.5 full-time equivalent jobs. And it's important to note here that this 81.5 full-time equivalent jobs includes mostly part-time employment opportunities and some full-time opportunities. So when we're dividing these numbers, this results in an average annual wage of $28,220 annually for the proposed use. And because this falls considerably below the average annual wage of Pinellas County, sports tourism cannot be qualified as a high wage or above average employer. And we find that this proposed amendment does not sufficiently balance against this criteria. And the next criteria we look at um, look at whether the subject property in question remains conducive to its surrounding uh, or to its designated employment uses. Next slide, please. The second criteria involves the extent to which the site can continue to support target employment opportunities. The large size and rectangular shape of this property is actually commonly found on sites that contain employment and industrial uses currently. And this configuration in particular is especially conducive to the needs of warehouse distribution uses where trucks can easily access the loading and unloading of areas for the last mile delivery of goods. The third criteria looks at the extent to which uses within the current or proposed category relate to its surrounding uses. And this current category is compatible with its surrounding uses because of its adjacency to the Tyrone Industrial Park located directly to the north. You'll see this indicated on maps four and five of this agenda item, and that accounts for approximately 88 acres of additional industrial land aside from this property. As such, this property is consistent with its surrounding uses as an employment site and is encouraged to remain so. Next slide, please. 
The fourth criteria looks at the location of the property in relationship to its access to arterial and interstate highway networks and other transit options. This subject property in particular is located approximately 4.5 miles from US Highway 19 North. And there are other sites around the county which are of a similar distance from a major arterial roadway, such as the Johnson Control Center located in Largo, which is approximately 3.5 miles from US Highway 19 North. Furthermore, recent trends have shown the need for sites which serve as a last mile solution for deliveries and have a need to serve more centralized locations in residential areas, such as the property in question. Therefore, this distance from a major arterial roadway should not be considered a chronic competitive disadvantage in maintaining the site as an industrial one. The last criteria is concerned with the extent to which any amendment is essentially consistent with local community standards, and the city at least finds that this proposed amendment is consistent with the policies of their comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. A key component of reserving industrial employment and target employment center designated lands is the factor of target employment opportunities, which I discussed in the first of the five balancing criteria. And as I mentioned, the rules not only consider the target employment opportunities that the proposed amendment can provide, but require that we compare this to what could potentially be available. And in order to compare this in a statistically des derived manner, our staff conducted a GIS and economic data analysis of existing employment and industrial sites around the county, which considered factors such as lot size, floor area ratio, and employment estimates. Based on this, it is estimated that a subject property of this size, which is approximately 29 acres, should actually be providing for 463 employees for industrial uses and 214 employees for storage, warehouse, or distribution uses. And based on the previously mentioned information, which was provided by the applicant, this proposed amendment is expected to provide 81.5 full-time equivalent employment opportunities, but a maturity, which is considered five years after its opening. As this falls significantly short of the estimates garnered from our analysis, staff does not find that this proposed amendment um, can provide feasible target employment opportunities, especially compared to those that could potentially be available. And to further illustrate this, we have compared this site to existing sites around the county. Next slide, please. The first example that we look at is the Valpac Manufacturing Office in St. Petersburg, which is approximately 20.9 acres in size, but with an employment estimate of 531 employees. Next slide, please. Next, we have the Halky Roberts Corporation, also located in St. Petersburg, which is 11 acres in size, but with an employment estimate of 362 employees. Next slide, please. Next is the previously mentioned Johnson Controls Incorporated office located in Largo, which is 12.2 acres in size, but has an employment estimate of 500 employees. And this is especially relevant, as I mentioned previously, because like the subject property, it isn't necessarily located directly adjacent to a major arterial roadway, but still provides for those target employment opportunities that we're looking for. Next slide, please. The last example that I'll provide today is the UPS Distribution Center in Pinellas Park, which is 19.5 acres in size, but with an employment estimate of 602 employees. And something I'd like to bring to the board's attention at this point is that there is a record of the city receiving a letter of interest from a separate applicant for the subject property in question, but after the proposed um, amendment was submitted for the redevelopment of the property as an industrial distribution center. And while this is not a formally submitted proposal, it must still be taken into consideration as a target employment opportunity that could potentially be available and one that staff finds would be better, a better use for the subject property in addition to being more economically beneficial than the proposed amendment. Next slide, please. I know that this has been a much longer land use case presentation than we're all accustomed to. Um, and I thank you for sticking with me as I provide some key concluding points. Firstly, the multimodal corridor category is inconsistent with the countywide rules policies that preserve industrial employment and target employment center lands for high wage job creation. Based on examples A through D I just provided, despite being on a property of a larger lot size, this proposed amendment does not provide a comparable number of employment opportunities in addition to lacking target employment opportunities based on the definition of target employment and the wage requirements of high wage above average target employment opportunities. As such, staff does not find this proposed amendment to provide for the desired target employment opportunities, especially when compared to those that could potentially be available. 
And due to this, this proposed amendment involves and will significantly impact countywide consideration 65317 concerning the reservation of industrial land, which includes the conversion of employment and target employment center categories. And based on these findings, as staff, we are recommending denial of this proposed amendment. Next slide, please. Lastly, to give you a general summary of the public comments received at the time that this presentation was created, the city had a record of receiving 121 comments by telephone and email, mostly opposing this request. And public opposition to this amendment generally includes the following concerns listed on the slide in front of you. In addition to this, Ford Pinnell staff have also received one call and one email from previously registered opponents citing these same concerns. And as of this morning, we received a handful of comments um, one letter in support this morning, two letters in opposition, and before the board meeting as well, we received a letter in support, which I believe was provided to you in hard copy um, from the Jungle Terrace Neighborhood Association. That should be on your desk. Um, but at this time, this concludes my presentation, and I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Nusheen. Uh, we also have a couple of other presenters on this item today. So uh, we're joined by Derek Kilborn of the city of St. Petersburg, who has 10 minutes. And the third presentation is well, also uh, from Brian Angst, who is with us today and is also allowed 10 minutes. Hi, Derek. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And thank you, Derek Kilborn, uh, manager for the city of St. Petersburg Urban Planning and Historic Preservation. Yes, I will start again. Uh, Derek Kilborn, manager for the city of St. Petersburg's Urban Planning and Historic Preservation Division. Uh, thank you for considering this case today. And before I begin, I also want to thank Ford Pinella staff for their counsel and assistance as we work through this application. We did recognize that this was going to be a very uh, difficult and challenging application for you to consider. So we were very sensitive about inviting them into the process very early in our dealings with the applicant um, to try to come to some compromise and agreeable solution about how to move forward on this case. This is a private initiated application that was submitted to the city by the current property owner, St. Pete LLC, and their contract purchaser, Jungle Terrace Land Company. They do have representatives that I think you'll be hearing from today, and they'll also be able to answer probably some specific questions you might have related to the presentation that you just received from Nusheen Rahman about uh, salaries and employment density and how that might match with the plan that they have going forward. Uh, first slide, please. And we'll advance to the next one then. Um, in this particular diagram, you can see that the property measures 29.11 acres. You're going to hear from some comments, commentors today. Uh, based on the public comments we received, they're primarily residents in those three apartment complexes to the east. In the Stone's Throw uh, condominium complex, one of the things we looked at at the city level was the potential density in the proposed plan and how that might match up with the allowable density at those sites. Uh, that stone's throw condos allows 24 units per acre. Brandywine Apartments is developed at 24 units per acre. And Somerset is developed at 14. And the proposal that you have um, in the uh, development agreement calculates out to approximately 21. So in terms of density per acre, we're right in the range. Uh, Nusheen did an excellent job describing the surrounding property, so we'll go ahead and advance to the next slide. In addition to the public comments, if the board needs, we have this slide showing you the location of the surrounding neighborhood associations. Uh, next slide, please. As was mentioned in the first presentation, we don't typically talk about the local zoning and future land use map categories, but in this case, it is important to um, review that information for you because of its relevance to how the county category is interpreted. So on this map here, uh, just quickly you can see this is showing the local zoning. It is currently industrial suburban and the proposal is to go to CCS1, Corridor Commercial Suburban-1. That is our primary mixed use category, allowing a full complement of commercial activities but also multifamily residential. Next slide. This slide is showing you our future land use 
MAP category, which is changing from industrial limited to planned redevelopment mixed use. We are retaining the target employment center overlay on this application. That's very important for us to get to a conclusion that the application is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. And the reason that's important is because the target employment center overlay in our local regulations allows a 100% intensity bonus to incentivize the establishment of manufacturing office, laboratory and research developments. And in a couple slides, I'm gonna have a, a table to show you how that translates. Uh, next slide, please. One thing that is really critical to this particular application is the development agreement. Uh, when this application first came to the city, frankly, in the form it was initially received, we could not accept it as being consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. Uh, the applicant had put forward a proposal to include a development agreement, and under two very important considerations, the city um, concluded that those very two uh, important considerations would help us get to a recommendation or finding of consistency. And the first is that the non-residential portion of the applicant's proposal would be developed first. So uh, we would not be in a situation where multifamily units were being constructed and then the non-residential portion was not. So that was very important to us. The second is that the multifamily portion would include a minimum of 30% workforce housing units. So in this case, the proposal as it stands would include a maximum of 623 apartment units. A minimum 30% of those would be required to be workforce housing. And to us, that workforce housing requirement relates directly to our economic and workforce development goals and initiatives. And so we saw a direct link there. Next slide, please. Uh, this next slide is just showing you that in the development agreement, the sports tourism facility is required to precede the residential. Uh, there is an accommodation for one of the multifamily buildings to coincide with the development of the sports recreation facility. Next slide, please. When the city receives a map amendment uh, application, of course, we do a review using the comprehensive plans, goals, objectives, and policies. And as I mentioned in this instance, we did make a finding of consistency and we focused on four primary elements, the land use, housing, transportation, and public school facilities elements. We also conducted a level of service analysis. I think today you're going to probably hear comments about transportation or sewer or water. Uh, we went through a full level of service analysis and the report shows that there is a uh, consistency or uh, meeting of the level of service standards in our comprehensive plan. Mass transit and complete streets is not measured by capacity. So we have included comments, but those are not measured by capacity. And also the stormwater is implemented at the time of site plan review and permitting. So that here too um, is not included. Next slide. Our comprehensive plan, like the countywide rules, includes uh, specific language for the protect, uh, protection of industrial lands. So on the screen, you can see our comprehensive plan has four criteria that we look at. The first is related to vacant and underutilized lands. Uh, despite efforts of the property owner over a long period of time, approximately 15 years or more, uh, this site has been underutilized or is currently sitting vacant. Number two, vacant or underutilized buildings. Um, the site has been vacant. There are no buildings there. Third, under poor quality job creation in terms of pay, employment density, and spinoff or multiplier effects. Again, the property has sat vacant for a long period of time, dating back to the mid 2000s. And then finally, chronic competitive disadvantages in terms of location, transportation, infrastructure, and other market considerations. For us looking at this property, it was uh, the physical distance to the Interstate 275 and US 19, we believe puts this property at a chronic di competitive disadvantage when compared to other large tracts of industrial land. 
This property was originally developed in the 1940s, and the railroad that ran along the side of the property provided transportation infrastructure to support that industrial use that uh, is no longer there. The groundwater contamination that was cited in the comment in the opening of your meeting today is something you'll also hear about. Um, we think that that has also had an impact on the marketing and usability of the site. And so after looking at the city's criteria, um, we are today, of course, considering how this plan relates to the county's criteria. I think Nusheen Rahman did a, a very detailed presentation of what you have to consider today. So next slide, please. Uh, when you look at those criteria, the first refers to target employment opportunities. Um, looking at this, the first thing we look at is, again, referring back to the city's criteria. We did that analysis and we made that finding. The second item uh, relating to land uses, if you could go to the next slide, please. The, the loss of employment or industrial opportunity is uh, very sensitive to us as it is you on a countywide basis. So we uh, took a look at our zoning and future land use categories and how that would relate to existing uses and what could be permitted after a map amendment would be effectuated. So in this chart, it's showing you the local zoning, industrial suburban, which it is today, and how those uh, incentivized uses in the city's target employment center program would be treated after the change under CCS1. And you'll see here that the only use uh, that it drops off in terms of opportunity is a temporary labor office. General office, medical office, veterinary office, light manufacturing, laboratories and research continue to be principal or in one case a special exception use but those would all still be allowed. Next slide, please. This slide shows you the countywide rules and the uses that are identified under the employment category um, are listed on the left. And you can see those are permitted uses per the countywide rules description. And then what would happen under the MMC? And you can see again that most of those uses would continue as either at the city zoning level, a principal use or a special exception use. So the only use that would drop out as a result of these map amendments would be the warehouse uh, land use type. So when we look at both of these, we do believe that there is a preservation of future opportunity for the employment and industrial related uses. Uh, there were comments about the development agreement prohibiting other uses, or I should say maybe restricting uses on the site to the sports recreation facility and multifamily use. Um, that is correct. It, it will limit the uses on the site to those two proposed land use types. Um, however, if there are future changes or amendments requested to the development agreement, it is important to remember that these other use types would still be preserved going forward. So um, one of the things that the development agreement is designed to do is prohibit um, non-employment or non-industrial uses. And so if there was a future request to amend the development agreement, or if in 20 plus years the development agreement expires, um, you still could not uh, uh, pursue 100% multifamily residential. So we're really trying to box out 100% multifamily residential and preserve that employment industrial opportunity. Next slide. Regarding amendment uh, site characteristics and amendment of area characteristics. So these two here combine, uh, I've already talked about proximity to the uh, city's major road network and if you go to the next slide, please. Um, I've included this map on the left side so that you can see that the property is currently not on a truck route. So this map that I'm showing you is from the city's comprehensive plan. And this shows you the identified truck routes in the city. Um, it's not on one. Now the industrial uh, categories that are located to the north of this site 
do have access to a truck route along Tyrone Boulevard. So again, this is another piece that contributed to our consideration is transportation and access to the larger network. It's almost five miles, it's 4.6 miles to the Interstate 275 from this site. And uh, just a little more than half that distance would be through a single family category. And so what was once uh, a critical piece for the city because of its location on the railroad um, now has become, in our opinion, uh, in many ways obsolete because the railroad no longer exists and the road network to the east um, is diminished. And uh, since this picture is up, the map on the right is also showing you um, our considerations in the site character or area characteristics. So the piece that is under consideration is that slim projection coming down to the south. Um, to the immediate east is a mixed use commercial and multifamily category. There's a park and single family uh, zoning and development to the west and to the south. So when we think about the industrial type of uses that can go there and the uh, cleaner type of manufacturing and employment opportunities that would still be preserved, we think that the application is moving in a direction that improves compatibility for the surrounding properties going forward um, and uh, in some ways negates what could be allowed today, which uh, would potentially be a very industrial type of uh, use. Supporting transportation and infrastructure characteristics is number four, we've talked about that, and number five, supporting redevelopment plans as it was identified in the county's presentation. Um, we did do a review and the city council took this up and has continued the amendment through this process. We believe that at the city level it is consistent with our uh, comprehensive plan and other related plans. Uh, that concludes the city's presentation and obviously we um, are available to answer questions. Tom Whelan, our transportation planner, is also here with me today if you have transportation-related questions. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. And um, our next speaker is Brian Angst. Excuse me? Oh, does someone, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Seal. You may have mentioned this and I might have missed it, but what was the vote by your planning and zoning board as well as your city council? Our commission was a unanimous recommendation and our city council was a unanimous recommendation, but I wanna be careful about how I characterize the city council action. The city council action was just the first reading and first public hearing to allow the application to continue to the point where we can apply to you today. So um, after your uh, review, if it is approved, it will return back to our city council for a second and final public hearing, and it will be at that point that the city council will make a final decision whether or not to approve the local amendments. Uh, were there any concerns addressed or expressed at that first city council meeting? Sure, there, there were uh, concerns expressed from the public, and there was some good dialogue among our council members and staff as well about proceeding in, in the pr preservation and protection of the employment and industrial uh, opportunities. Um, it was felt following that discussion that it, it certainly merited further consideration and so the application was allowed to continue forward. I think that in the initial presentation there were some um, concerns that were put on the slide from the county's presentation. Those did match the public comments that we received from the adjoining neighbors and residents. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Gerard. Just a small question. When you talk, when you talk about workforce housing, what are you talking about? Uh, for us, it's a very specific program. Uh, workforce housing units are required to be 80, 100, and 120% of uh, area median income. So uh, that 30% would be guaranteed through the development agreement. And then there would be a workforce housing agreement put in place to structure uh, it's a rotating ladder, so you, the first two units, uh, and I, I have to be careful about detail because I don't work in that department, but my understanding is it's a ladder, so you work through the first two units are, uh, for example, 80% and then 120 and then 100, and then you recycle back through the ladder. Okay, thanks. And I have a question, Derek. So. 
in order for the city staff to recommend this, it has to be compliant, consistent with the target employment center category, correct? Correct. And the it's an overlay, yes. It's an overlay, okay. But the amendment that we're being asked to consider, it seems to me it undermines the goals of the TEC because it would result in fewer jobs with less pay despite having a lot more land compared to some other industrial properties. And I know some of the examples we looked at were really close to 275. Um, this one's not, so I understand that's an important distinction, but it, it just seems like we're, we're, we're calling it a target employment center overlay a name, but in reality, I feel like we're, we're, we could be undermining that significantly. I think that it might mean slightly different things at the mm -hmm. city level and the county level. So okay. at the city level, when our staff does the analysis against the comprehensive plan, we're looking at the land use category, mm -hmm. which in this case would be for us, planned redevelopment, mixed use. And then there is the target employment center overlay. The target employment center overlay is a multiplier that allows for additional floor area ratio if it includes one of those targeted industries. Uh, so for us, at the local level, it's a multiplier. And it's an incentive for people to de develop those uses and get access to more floor area ratio. Um, at the county level, you heard a presentation about employment density. Mm -hmm. And employment density is not something that is uh, prescribed in terms of how we conduct analyses at the city's comprehensive plan. So when the city looks at this and brings the recommendation forward, uh, we're doing so based on the comprehensive plan. And again, employment density is not something that we look to as a criterion for evaluation. Okay. And about the development agreement, the development agreement, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it was really important for the city to make sure that we received um, commitments that, that the project would deliver X number of jobs, X number, 30% affordable workforce housing. And also it is, it would, the proposal would be to go to multimodal corridor. So of course it has to connect to the Pinellas Trail. Um, the, the PAC committee recommendation, I see that it said that they recommended to approve the amendment conditional on workforce housing being guaranteed. Did they forget about the jobs and the connection to Pinellas Trail or was that included in the recommendation? And I'm sorry, I know you, you're not necessarily the person to speak for the PAC, but I'm, I'm asking you the question to make sure that the development agreement that we negotiated is being honored in its entirety. Right. At the PAC meeting, there were a series of questions about workforce housing and the guarantee for workforce housing. Um, this was a very important piece for the city's recommendation. And without it, we could not have given this a, a favorable recommendation or finding of consistency. Mm -hmm. So in the development agreement, there is language guaranteeing that of the multifamily units, 30% would be provided as workforce housing. Um, I think that the PAC action included a reference to the guarantee for workforce housing um, we believe that the guarantee is already in the development agreement, but I think it reinforces the idea that that's a very critical element to this overall proposal and that anything moving forward should have this agreement and guarantee for the workforce housing. Okay. And then, thank you for that, mm -hmm. Derek. Um, and then just to, just to level set, I mean, we're here today as Forward Pinellas as part of a legislative item to vote on potentially changing the countywide map. But th there's a little bit of a wrinkle because there's an amendment to allow for going over the, the cap of square footage for a sports field. And so while there is a private development application kind of driving this, um, we're, we're being asked today to be put in a position to 
consider voting for this and that uh, amendment, but this may or may not be the project that ultimately gets built. I mean, um, this could be sold. It, it, there's it's no guarantee what could happen actually with the site plan, but meanwhile, we would have voted to sort of undo, you know, kind of like bake in a condition to the countywide map. And I'm just wondering, why don't we, why don't we work that out in the development agreement on the city side? Why are we being asked to change a map that that could have implications, you know, unintended? Mm -hmm. We we have a, a commitment from the private applicant to uh, sign on the development agreement with the city, guaranteeing the 30% workforce housing mm -hmm. and the prioritization of the non-employment portion of their plan, or I'm sorry, the non-residential portion of their plan. So they are prioritizing construction of the employment sports recreation facility. Um, the category today does allow, the countywide plan category today allows commercial recreation, but there is an acreage limit of mm -hmm. five acres. And because this site totals 29.8, one one, the only way for them to get to commercial recreation would be to um, have a countywide plan map amendment approved. So, right. okay. uh, the development agreement is, is kind of bound to the as the city map amendment moves forward. The the map amendment is going to be bound to that development agreement, and so if the countywide plan map is approved for an amendment, um, when, when that goes into effect in relation to the city level plan, this has to come back to our city council. Uh, I think I understand what you're saying is a, a timing issue. You don't want to amend the countywide plan map and then have it come back down to the city level and there not be a final city action on this. Well, my, my question is, I mean, it's a process question. I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with, you know, sort of baking this in to the countywide map at this point. Mm. But, you know, but I'm not, yeah, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to, you know, keep an open mind sure. and, you know, want to work with all sides on this, but it just seems like, I don't know, this just strikes me as odd and, and it, it caught my attention because by the very act of, and please correct me if I'm mm. wrong, by the very act of allowing us to go over the cap of the recreational field space, that is what messes up the numbers for the jobs and the pay. So could we, you know, I just don't wanna accidentally vote for this to go forward. Then it turns out, well, maybe something happens or changes with the project that's in mind now that's being presented that we're not voting on. But meanwhile, we've changed the map to sort of allow future projects to come in that would be less than really what we aspire to or hoped for with this industrial property. And we don't have a lot of industrial land left. So that that's why I'm concerned about not wanting to, to undermine that. Mm. There's, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if there's a procedure or a, a way to bind the two together, but um, for us, we, it, it's the development agreement combined with the request to amend the zoning and the future land use map category at the city level um, would only be important um, to us. I'm, I'm, tr I'm sorry, I understand your concern. I'm trying to think how best to answer it since we're in a, a procedural question that mm -hmm. involves maybe county staff. Um, I don't know if there's a way to bind your decision to the local decision um, with the development agreement and the workforce housing and prioritization of the non-residential piece. I don't know if that's possible. We typically do not condition map amendments um, at the city other than to have a development agreement included. Okay. I, I see we have a question from Commissioner Gerard. I guess my question has 
to do with the difference between the city's target employment um, center category and the county's targeted industries and how mm. the criteria for us has everything to do with specific types of uh, businesses. We want to see their uh, uh, salary levels that are acceptable um, and that sort of thing, which is, you know, part of the is all wrapped up in that industrial category that we're trying to uh, to attract certain industries there. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's sort of apples and oranges that your target employment centers, I'm not sure that, that seems to be wide open. It seems to include just about everything. Whereas ours is pretty narrow and, and targeted to high income jobs. Mm. Um, so I guess that's a, a big distinction for me. Uh, what would not be allowed in your target employment center category? Well, just to, to clarify, our target employment center is not a category, it's an overlay. Okay, and so overlay. it does not prescribe or prohibit specific uses. It, it only establishes a multiplier for certain types of uses. So, But there seems to be a broad range of uses. So what, I guess... It relates to offices, uh, light manufacturing, laboratories, research and development. Everything pretty much but commercial. Um, or retail. Yes, it, it, that's right, yeah. Okay. Right. Mayor Bajowski. Thank you. I, I don't know when the appropriate time to ask questions, but since it started, I figured, yeah. you know, I would. I mean, I, I know we have the applicants going to make a presentation, but I think my questions are, are a little bit more for either Forward Pinellas, the Forward Pinellas team or the St. Pete team. Um, so the Forward Pinellas team is talking about how there are examples of access to transportation and that type of thing. And you guys are saying we don't agree with that opinion. Um, and that it's outdated because it used to have a railroad there and all of that. Um, so in the staffing, it said that it was 20 years vacant is what it said. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to understand what anyone from a government perspective, I understand it's not the government's responsibility, but I also know that the county government has a very large economic development department, and I know that you all do, unlike my small city of Dunedin. So I wanna know what anyone has done in over those 20 years to find someone to actually use the property in the way it's intended. Um. <clears throat> I, I didn't personally work on those efforts before, uh, as it was a different department and staff at that time. There, there have been efforts from the city's economic development department to recruit users for that site. Um, at some portion of time, it was vacant, and uh, there used to obviously be a facility there. Uh, so in some portion of that 15 to 20 years, there, there was a building there that was uh, being underutilized because of its conditions. But there were uh, serious efforts from the city's economic development department to match users to that site. And that also is something that contributed to our recommendation now, because we had been party to those efforts in the past. Um, so we know that there were efforts to match people to the site, and it wasn't just a current applicant telling us that there had been previous efforts. Um, I believe that there were also efforts from Pinellas County to recruit users to that site. Um, and to date, there, we haven't found somebody uh, until this application came forward. Wait, can you tell me if the county is actually, their economic development department has? Well, I think Mike oh. Midell would be hey, the Mike. person to speak to yeah. that. Mike's here, um, and I know I'd he's like planning to, I mean, to I'd like to understand it. If yeah. it's that difficult, I want to know. But, I mean, we don't want to cut our nose off to spite our face if it's not marketable. I know, I know the county economic development has an inventory of all parcels that they regularly market uh, and promote 
to uh, potential developers, but Mike can speak to that better than I can. Sorry, Mike, I didn't see no, you over there. No, glad to. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I'm Mike Midell, the Economic Development Director for Pinellas County. And uh, this is a very viable industrial site. I want to make everyone know that that is true today as it was previously. We have, um, we've just recently uh, relocated a company from New Jersey, SS White, that is out on uh, Park Street, north of, uh, of um, Tyrone Boulevard, an even further distance from the interstate than this site. Uh, this site has current industrial uses immediately north of it, including Raytheon's uh, R&D facility for an entire division of their company. It is currently used for industrial uses um, extensively in that area north of there. Uh, we have not had a rail dependent prospect in uh, my time at at uh, the, the county, 17 years. Um, it is not something that we try to attract any longer. It is, uh, you know, most of our industrial is, looks just like an office building or a big box retailer. It's, uh, it's not a, uh, an eyesore and it's not, um, uh, you know, outdoor storage and those types of uses. So we anticipate this site being that. One of the problems we've had um, with this particular site is the active remediation that's been going on for years. And it has scared away some industrial um, clients because they don't want to be in chain of title. This uh, remediation process is nearing completion now, and the uh, site is much more attractive now than it was 20 years ago when this, uh, the site was just beginning cleanup. The other thing is to, that's different today is that we actually have an employment sites program based on the penny four allocation of 4.15% of the, uh, the sales tax every year that will, is designed to create a vertical construction of office and industrial space that comes alongside the developer or an employer and helps close the gap between what it costs them to create that space and their potential return on investment as a, as a developer or you know, their pro forma as an actual employer. So we have a tool in our hands now that uh, for the first time that uh, the first application window actually closes on the 11th and uh, we are actively uh, promoting that to developers and employers now and um, it's a whole new way of addressing this type of site. The site does have truck access to I-275, 22nd Avenue is a, a truck route and um, it has the size and shape of a uh, property that is attractive to manufacturers. It's um, including the, you know, the Raytheon facility and SS White. So um, the other consideration uh, is the, the value of industrial property to the local community and to the local governments. Um, we, for years now, since 2004, we've done multiple studies on the need to preserve our industrial property, the fact that it's going away and that we need to preserve it because it provides high quality, high wage jobs for our citizens. It brings new money into our local economy. And um, beyond that, the actual cost of service to an industrial property is 30 cents for every dollar of revenue you collect. On the average, this is uh, the cost of community service studies that have been done around the country looking at, at all of the major states. But on average, you're looking at 30 cents of cost for every dollar of tax revenue. Now with uh, residential projects, you're looking at $1.16 of cost for every dollar you collect in revenue. So you can't do that all day long or you're gonna be running out of funds to provide those services because especially in Florida, we put a lot of our property tax burden on our commercial and industrial customers and that money benefits the residential property throughout the county. One of the other major considerations is that the, the rents available for industrial property are about $5 to $6 a square foot. The rents available on retail and office space are much, much higher, five, four to five times higher. And the, uh, the result is that if you allow another use other than res, uh, industrial on a property, more than likely it's going to take that other use. Even if it's a, you know, an opportunity, you, know, you can put industrial there, but no developer in his right mind would do that because of the return on investment that you could have with multifamily retail on that same site. 
and or retail, you know, retail or multifamily residential. So those are the, the hurdles that we're up against with industrial property. We can go out and assemble land in other land use categories and convert it to industrial use, but that's very expensive to do because all other land use costs more per acre than industrial. And uh, so that's, that's the problem that we're up against as economic developers in this county. And I hope you'll take that into consideration in your deliberations. If I can just follow up on something he said. Yes. Um, Mike, uh, you talked about the contamination and it's, that's been going on for the last, since you've been here in mm -hmm. 20 years. Why has it taken so long? Well, the, uh, it, it entered into the superficial uh, right. uh, water quality, though. So, so there is um, a separate pumping station that is retained on the southern right. end of this property. I think you've seen it on the maps. Yes. And that continues to bubble and recycle the water. And it will continue for many years to come. So is but it, it just takes time to actually pull all the water from the, you know, the water table in the shallow aquifer and clean it up. What about the soil? About the what? The soil. Itself. Yes, uh, the soil is, it will remain in place and it will be an issue, um, but it's uh, mostly within the water because most of the pollutants are waterborne and, and that's where it will shift off of site too. So the concern has been how do we keep the water from, from leaving the site? I guess so. I don't hear anything you telling me that anything's going to change with the contamination anytime soon. Well, so the, what's it, it's already, it is already improved. There's no right. doubt about it. And the, the property to the north end of this parcel was always office when Raytheon was there. Right. So there isn't yeah. ground contamination on that northern edge. I guess what I'm trying to get at is what is going to change in the next five years? Mm -hmm. What changes is the fact that we can bring along financing through the penny for Pinellas to help close the gap between what it takes to build on that site an industrial property and the returns that are available to an industrial user. So, so that that's is the, the only difference at this point in your mind that between the, the last years 20 of, years and yeah, then the next five. That, that and the 20 years of already cleanup being done on the site. And the fact that the building, the site has been cleared. For many, for 10 of those years, there were old buildings on the site that nobody wanted. Right. So the demolition definitely added value to the site. Who did the demolition, user. the owner? I don't recall. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it is clear now. And are property clear. owners allowed to apply for that, or does that have yes. to be a city that applies for that money? No, no. In fact, in the first stage, we encourage the actual employer or developer to apply for it. Okay. And then my final question is from the city about the letter that came in about a UPS or some distribution center or something. Uh, Thank you, Mike. Yes, and then um, I, I want to get to Mr. Angst. So let's take this last question and then we'll make sure that we hear from everyone. You, you want me to just generally address it? The letter, yeah. Yes, uh, okay. So when, what was it? Uh, there was a letter received at the city from a company called Stonemont Financial Group and they had indicated some interest in the property. Uh, it did come in during uh, or as part of the public comments for this application. So, um, you know, they're, they're uh, offering and referencing several things in their letter for us as staff doing an evaluation of the application in front of us. Uh, there was nothing in this letter that guaranteed uh, investment in the property from this particular individual or company. And so for us, it's, it's not something that we can consider in our evaluation of the application in front of us and whether or not that is consistent with the comprehensive plan goals, objectives, and policies. And so it wasn't referenced in our analysis, but it was included in the public comment portion of the staff report provided to our commission and council. Gotcha. Okay. So it wasn't sent to your staff outside of this hearing process for this particular application? The letter itself was addressed to Alan Delisle, who's the city development administrator, and Elizabeth Abernethy, who is the director for the city's planning and uh, planning and development services department. Oh, so it was presented to the staff. Okay. Yes. All right, thank you. I really want to move forward, but uh, Commissioner Seal, did you have a question for, for Derek? So, um, and what was the asking price on the parcel, and has it been for sale for five years? Is that what I read? 
I do not have the answer to that question. If the applicant, uh, private applicant is presenting, they may have that answer for you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And next we will hear from uh, Brian Onks Jr. Uh, Brian, thank you for your patience and flexibility with me and allowing us to entertain a few questions and comments before your presentation. Uh, we're really glad to have you and your team here. Uh, our pleasure, Madam Chair, and I'm sorry if I was jumping out of my chair a little bit, but I got some cardio out of it, I guess. <laughs> okay. Madam Chair, before I begin, um, I do have a PowerPoint, but the PowerPoint it, uh, can just be um, rotated from slide to slide uh, periodically. So, um, uh, Madam IT Director um, in Cyberspace, you can um, just feel free to every 10, 15 seconds uh, change a slide. It's, the presentation is not dependent on that. And also, I would like to ask for equal time. Um, I believe the, the Fort Pinal staff received about 20 minutes, uh, and then with Mr. Mydell, it might have gone up to closer to 30 minutes. I don't intend to exceed 20 minutes, but I can't address everything that's been asked and everything that's been discussed in less Wait. than 20 minutes. You um, you will certainly have your 10 minutes and, of course, have the flexibility to answer other questions as um, the, the preceding speakers did, but let's hear the first part of your presentation for the 10 minutes. Uh, Madam but Chair, no, I, I'm not going to have a hook and pull you off the... Off Madam the, Chair, yes. I've been advised by legal that we do need to allow him the 20 minutes that was afforded to forward Pinella staff. Thank okay. you. Very well then. Okay, it's all yours, Mr. Onks. Thank you, Madam Chair, and mm -hmm. I will speak quickly. Uh, Brian Onks, 625 Court Street, on behalf of the applicant, Jungle Terrace Land Company, LLC, Porter Development, the contract purchaser for what is now known as the Raytheon site. I do want to say, as I started talking uh, with the St. Pete uh, CPPC and the St. Pete City Council, it's important to realize that after decades of dormancy, decades of dormancy, the project and the time has finally come to turn this community eyesore, this environmentally problematic, underutilized, chronically impaired site into a source of community pride and community activation. I'm very proud to tell you that for more than a year, going back to Valentine's Day of 2020, my client has met proactively with the city staff, met proactively with all three of the neighborhood associations, Azalea, Jungle Terrace, and Crossroads, and has met with the Ford Pinellas staff, and has met with Mr. Mydell and his staff. This is an extremely collaboratively developed project, and it brings a significant amount to the table for the city and for the community. Um, I'm very happy to tell you that we received two letters of support, one from Dr. Ed Carlson with the Jungle Terrace Civic Association, indicating that his board and his members unanimously support this proposal. We received another letter from the Azalea Neighborhood Association, Mr. Dominic Greasy, also indicating that that neighborhood association unanimously supports this proposal and that they would much prefer this healthy workforce housing, active recreation on their property as opposed to a warehouse distribution center with massive trucks coming in and out all day and all night. That's the practical discussion that we're having. And I understand that that's not necessarily before you on the land use amendment, but it's important. And I want you to get the full context. Madam Chair, to answer your question, the development agreement was painstakingly negotiated with Mr. Delisle, uh, Mr. Dima, uh, Ms. Britton Wilson, Ms. Abernathy, and the city and their economic development. It is very important for you to know that there's a provision in the development agreement that says if the development does not occur as proposed, the city has the right to initiate the process to change the land use and zoning designations of the property to the designations that existed at the time of the execution of this agreement. So that means that if the sports facility is not developed and if the 30% workforce housing is not developed, the city will initiate the land use amendment back. We are continuing to have the employment center uh, category. So the only thing they'd have to add back is warehouse. They're not losing that use. So if this project were not developed, the city could revert the land use, 
Or they could say, well, we've got enough industrial uses and someone else is going to come in and, and use the site. So that is specifically addressed in the development agreement. It's also important to note that this development agreement, this is not an unusual process. I came through a little while ago on Largo, 40, 4825 East Bay Drive, with a development agreement where the city said they didn't want gas stations, they didn't want drive throughs but they would let us do you know, commercial restaurants and, and uh, retail and things of that nature. And that land use amendment didn't become effective until after the CPA hearing, after this hearing, and until the city council made the city commission in Largo made the final vote of adoption. And I know, I'm sure Commissioner Smith remembers that. So that's the same thing that's happening here. If we get the approval of Forward Pinellas and we get the approval of the CPA for the land use amendment, the legislative item, we go back to the St. Petersburg City Council on May 20th, and we have to have an executed development agreement by that date. And if we do not, they will not adopt the land use amendment and it will not become formal. So you won't be in a situation, Madam Chair, where your land use has changed and this project falls through. Because if, it cha if it's changed, you've got a development agreement. And if you've got a development agreement, you've got the right to revert it. So I wanted to make that very clear up front. I know that's complicated, um, but, and I usually have Mr. Dima here to kind of back me up, and I know he's not here. But I wanted you to know that that was very, very, very deliberately developed by the city staff in the city's attorney's office. They would not put the city council in a position to make this change without a guarantee. I also wanted to highlight we have the unanimous approval of the CPPC, who heard argument from Mr. Mydell at their hearing, and we had the unanimous approval of the city council to move forward with the conversation, not indicating that they're necessarily going to vote for it at the end of the day, but that this would brought so much to the table that it was important to move forward. One thing that I want to really emphasize that has not been mentioned, workforce housing supports employment. Workforce housing is part and parcel of employment. And the PAC, the Planning Advisory Committee, recognized that. They unanimously voted in favor of the city staff and the applicant to recommend you approve the project. You have planners from Tarpon Springs to St. Petersburg and everywhere in between who heard this exact same argument from both the Fort Pinellas staff, the St. Pete City staff, and the applicant, and who are recommending as planning experts that you adopt the view of the St. Pete City staff and of the applicant. And again, this is a legislative item and we have a respectful difference of opinion about whether this meets the target employment category. And before I get too deeply into that, I want to pass it over to Mr. Pergolizzi. He's uh, AICP, our planning and transportation planning director or uh, expert. Then I have Mr. Uh, Eric Sullivan from Sports Facilities Advisors, who are, is our employment and economic development expert. And then I have uh, Mr. Greg Schultz from Cardno, who's our environmental expert, because there's significant differences of opinion about whether the remediation of the site is sufficient enough to support industrial, or if this is really the best and only option. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Robert Pergolizzi with Gulf Coast Consulting, my AICP certified planner and a transportation planner. Um, uh, thank you, Brian. Moving right into the target employment center uh, category here, the staff reports uh, relies that relies on the notion that the sports tourism is not specifically listed as target employment in the countywide rules. The countywide rules, as as stated, includes the words "but not limited to," meaning, and then it goes on to list seven or eight seven or eight categories, meaning that it is not a finite list. It is a constantly evolving list. And youth sports tourism is a growing industry nationwide. And Mr. Sullivan will speak to that more. Uh, we also meet the, the definition of a primary industry in the countywide rules, and that a primary industry is defined as an industry that imports more than half of its revenue from outside Pinellas County. And that's what this sports tourism facility would do. It would be bringing families from all over the United States States to our area. They would, be, they would need to stay at the hotels on the beaches and they'd be patronizing the restaurants in the area and also visiting other attractions while here. I can tell you from personal experience of a father of a, a son that played competitive hockey for 14 years and a daughter that did competitive gymnastics for 14 years, I spent tens of thousands of dollars in cities all throughout this country following my kids around and it was very enjoyable and I wouldn't, uh, I would do it again. Uh, so now regarding the, um, 
the uh, benefits, economic benefits, I'll ask Mr. Sullivan from Sports Facilities Advisors uh, to speak. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Board, for the opportunity to address you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Sullivan. We're at 600 Cleveland Street, uh, Suite 910, Clearwater, Florida. Um, SFC, the sports facilities companies, which comprise the sports facilities advisories, development, and management, uh, has been really fortunate and blessed to serve over 3,000 projects across the country, over $15 billion of planned and developed assets, just like what we're talking about today. And what I'm most excited about is this is our chance to get to do it where we live, where our families live, uh, and here in our backyard. So our experience with this, uh, this, this project actually started in 2019. Through a competitive bid process, we were hired by Pinellas County to conduct a, a feasibility study for a sp sports tourism asset to be developed uh, somewhere here in the county, site agnostic. Uh, we worked very closely with uh, Tim Ramsberger and Visit St. Pete Clearwater to fully vet that opportunity and in May of 2020 came back with positive findings to suggest that there was a very viable opportunity here in the county and that the highest and best use would be to develop an indoor multi-sport recreation event center that could complement and offset some of our great assets and amenities that we already have here in the county. With that presentation, uh, we were directed by the county to uh, further explore public-private partnership opportunities and look for different ways to help bring this to our community. Uh, I say serendipitously at that time, uh, we also met Mr. Porter and the Porter Development Team and really brought the idea and the opportunity together to say, hey, here's a way that we can serve the county need, support tourism, and also create a great mixed use development uh, here in the county. Um, when you look at the, uh, the development itself, the 150,000 square feet uh, event center, it's important to understand, will be supported by both a clear Spain court space that we can serve basketball, volleyball, cheer, dance, pickleball, uh, gymnastics, you name it. But we also have a number of complementary uses that very much drive local sport, uh, sport participation, fitness, wellness, hospitality, and uh, entertainment. We do that through both Monday through Thursday local traffic and also certainly evening, uh, weekend, uh, summertime opportunities for youth and amateur sports. The punchline here is that at maturity, we will generate over 17, excuse me, up to $17 million in direct economic benefit to the community and nearly 100 uh, full-time equivalent jobs. Uh, I do want to address that, as you heard from staff, this is nearly 100 full-time equivalents, but what's important about that, it's not a straight line analysis. As you can imagine, sports are seasonal in nature. We'll have a number of full-time jobs, as well as a number of part-time jobs and seasonal employment opportunities. But when you look at the full-time managers and directors, we'll have over 20 full-time uh, staff members that will be above the target employment range. And when you look at our total wages, the feasibility study suggests that we'll generate 2.6 to 3.5 million in salaries. And in total, that's 3.2 million to 4.3 million in total payroll benefits, bonuses, and taxes paid uh, through this development. So when you look at the opportunity to drive both tourism, drive local health, wellness, recreation, entertainment. Um, these types of projects really do serve as a hub of the community. And I want to address just one other thing mentioned in the public comment related to home values and other values. I know it was compared to a theme park, which is by no means what we're uh, recommending or suggesting today. But what it did, uh, uh, I just want to clarify is in 2019, we were hired by FRPA, Florida Recreation and Park Association, to conduct a statewide economic impact analysis. And the findings of that report were that these projects uh, actually increase home values, increase the health, wellness of communities, the walkability of neighborhoods, and overall promote uh, healthy activity in, in communities. So in addition to the 16 plus million dollars in economic benefit, the community benefit, um, and the jobs it creates, obviously with the housing, we think this is a really great project and happy to answer any questions that anyone has uh, here today. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Greg Schultz, um, professional engineer with Cardno, 380 Park Place Boulevard, Clearwater. I'm a senior principal, and I just wanted to speak to some of the environmental concerns. As we know, the project has a long legacy of groundwater contamination. Uh, I think it's important to, to note that that contamination issue is going to remain to be addressed by Raytheon and their consultants as part of the ongoing cleanup. And um, the overall impacts of this proposed development on that actually improves the overall uh, situation out there. Currently, the, the uh, 
property is unpaved, allowing rainfall to infiltrate into the groundwater and potentially spread the contamination. So uh, the new development is going to be a largely paved area that's going to limit that infiltration and improve the situation out there. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment on was that it was said that the remediation is nearly complete out there. I don't think that's accurate. Uh, the, the remediation's been ongoing for over 10 years. Yeah. The plume dynamics have not changed very much at all. It extends quite a distance into the surrounding neighborhoods. And in my opinion, the, uh, the remediation is going to be ongoing for the foreseeable future, many, many years, uh, to address the ongoing impacts. And I'm available for any questions if anyone has any. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, hello, Robert Pergolizzi again. Uh, I know Derek spoke to uh, Section 6.5.4.4, the countywide rules and the criteria for conversion of industrial land. Um, I want to speak more to the multimodal corridor use. This is truly a multimodal corridor use in that we have access to the Pinellas Trail. The Pinellas Trail forms the eastern boundary of this project. And we are integrating the Pinellas Trail into the project. In fact, we've spoken with Paul Cozy, the Parks Director, about connections to the trail. And we've taken his advice on how many we should have, what they should look like, and so forth. Also, we have access to transit. There is a transfer station at the Tyrone Mall about a quarter mile east of this project. So we'll be able to utilize the benefits of mass transit. Uh, as Brian stated before, we have neighborhood support from two of the three neighborhood associations. The only neighborhood, the only neighbors objecting are those that are east of the Pinellas Trail, which is a 60-foot wide right-of-way, which serves as a buffer uh, between our site and uh, the apartments and condos to the east. Uh, from a land use perspective, we believe and the city believes that this serves as a transition between the activity center to the east, the Tyrone Activity Center, which is that large blue on your, on your, on your map, and Azalea Park to the west. We actually, on the west side of 72nd Street is a city park, a very, very large city park. Um, this particular piece of property is the only property that's designated industrial limited on the city's plan and employment on the county's plan that is south of 22nd Avenue, a four lane divided arterial road. The Tyrone Industrial Park is to the north and that's about, as staff mentioned, 88 acres of industrial uses doing well. Then on the south side of uh, 22nd Avenue, you have this property that is designated industrial, and then everything else around it is either residential or a park with some commercial up where the LA Fitness is, right on the corner of uh, 22nd Avenue and the trail. Um, and further, um, with all due respect to Ms. Rahman's presentation, the examples that she gave of employment and equivalent jobs Every one of those examples were in fully industrial areas, some of them adjacent to the interstate, some of them adjacent to railroads. We're not like that. This piece of property is uh, pr primarily in a residential neighborhood with only the uh, Tyrone, uh, Tyrone Industrial Park on the north side of 22nd Avenue. And finally, uh, we ask that your, uh, you consider your PAC recommendation for approval unanimously, and I'll turn it back to Brian for summary. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Madam Chair. Just very briefly, I'll be very concise. We have a respectful disagreement with the four Pinellas staff. We're very, very, very happy to have the support of the two out of the three neighborhoods and the St. Petersburg City staff, as well as the CPPC and the City Council unanimously to this point. It goes back to the City Council after it goes through the county process for final approval to confirm that those guarantees that you're being told about the jobs, about the economic development, about the tourism dollars, about the workforce housing, the sorely needed workforce housing that goes directly into employment and economic development, that those are guaranteed in the development agreement. So again, I wanna ensure you that this land use amendment will not happen if this project doesn't happen. And if this development agreement is entered into and the land use is amended and the project doesn't happen, the city will revert it back to the current existing condition. So why do we have the respectful disagreement? And again, this is a legislative decision. It's not quasi-judicial. So all you need to vote yes on this application is a, is a rational basis. And it's perfectly fine for reasonable and rational people to disagree from time to time. And it happens a lot, as you all know, as elected officials. Here's why this is consistent with the countywide rules and the target employment and economic development. Number one, we are creating 100 full-time equivalent jobs, as Mr. Sullivan testified to. The letter 
that is being referred to by the Fort Pinellas staff says, this facility will bring 100 full-time jobs. So the alternative proposal of the warehouse distribution center with the trucks going in and out all night and day is 100 full-time jobs. So we're bringing the same number of jobs. But what they're not bringing is $17 million a year in economic development through heads and beds and folks that are spending money on our beaches, not just in St. Petersburg, in our restaurants, not just in St. Petersburg, that are also making an extended stay and going throughout the county to the Clearwater Marine Aquarium and the Dali and all of the other great amenities we have to offer. A, a warehouse also doesn't activate the Pinellas Trail and support Azalea Park, which is abutting this property. This project does. Another reason why we are uh, consistent is the workforce housing. Again, the PAC recognized that. It was specifically asked by planners from other jurisdictions, from your jurisdiction, some of you, doesn't workforce housing support employment? And you know, I think the obvious answer is yes, it does. So we're bringing economic development through sports tourism dollars, we're bringing 100 full-time equivalent jobs, and we're bringing uh, the sorely needed workforce housing in beautiful market rate development. Uh, and the other, the last, last point on why we believe it's consistent with the countywide goals and rules is because, again, the county commission engaged sports facilities advisors to find a project just like this in 2019. So we think that's further evidence that this is obviously a priority for the county and a, and a great thing for the county. Thank you very much. We'll answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Angst. And if it's okay with the board, because we're in public hearing, let's just go ahead to the public comment. And then uh, when we come back to board discussion, um, we can have the speakers come back up and take as long as they need to answer questions. So with that, um, and thank you very much for all of the presentations. Uh, with that, um, I will ask if there's any proponents wishing to be heard. Sarah, are there any proponents either in the room or in Zoom? There are any proponents, proponents in Zoom. Please use the raise hand button at this time or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. We will do the in the room proponents first. I have four, three of the four uh, just spoke, Mr. Unks, Mr. Sullivan, and Mr. Poglisi, followed by Dr. Ed Carlson. Mr. Ungst, would you like to speak at this time? No, uh, we're, Mr. Carlson's in the overflow room, so they're bringing him in. Um, I was just notified that uh, Mr. Ed Carlson is in the overflow room and they're bringing him in. Okay, uh, next was Mr. Sullivan, if he wishes to still address the board. And then Mr. Pergolese, if he wanted to still address the board. Okay, um, that was a no, but we do have uh, Mr. Carlson here. Okay, Dr. Carlson, you have three minutes once you state and spell your name and state your address. Thank I will you, be Carlson. Me. Good me. afternoon, board is. and Chair Rice. I'm Dr. Ed Carlson, Jungle Terrace Civic Association President and President of West Neighborhoods United. Jungle Terrace is one of the oldest and largest neighborhood associations in St. Petersburg since 1954 and Azalea is two years older than us since 1952. Both of our boards and our memberships have evaluated this process pre-COVID and then the post-COVID shift and according to land use, zoning, all other aspects. We want to have the sports, the sports complex, the neighborhood beach in the form of a crystal lagoon and the workforce housing. I can tell you that Azalea Neighborhood Association in federal court sued over the contamination of this property and they came away with a financial settlement for each property owner in the neighborhood. So we're very much on top of what's been going on for 15 years or more in regard to the contamination of where it is now and at the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the Federal Department of Environmental Protection are both on top of this. Second thing is employment. Is Tyrone Industrial Park is in Jungle Terrace neighborhood. We have not had a full industrial park for as long as I've been there for 37 years. There's vacant property there now. Um, only two things we've had in the last five years is Molly Suds, which employs six people making organic soap, and a 
storage facility that took over a very active business before that covers a large part. Veterans Medical Supply covers four square, four square blocks, two blocks by two blocks, and they employ 16 people. Um, Mastery Marine Engines employs 23 huge people, place. Um, motorcycle place has a large piece of property, employs six. Uh, roofing company employs 20. They picked out the most employee dense in property to get up to their number that they did. If you average the employment across the whole Tyrone Industrial Park, the average is 20 employees per acre, which would be 56 on this. So there has been no employment for 20 years. There will be no employment if we don't do this. If the county's willing to guarantee us somebody different in the next two or three years and willing to post a bond and pay the neighborhoods if we don't get it, that's fine. But to say no to this because of some pipe dream of a number of employees is, I'm not gonna say anything. Um, anyway, <laughs> we need this place for employment, but more so for the good of our neighborhood. So we have a neighborhood beach, we have a neighborhood recreation facility, and we have workforce housing. So we urge you to move this project forward. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, who's our next speaker? If there's anyone in Zoom wishing to speak in this time, a proponent, please use the raise hand button at this time or press star nine on the phone. I see no other proponents. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any opponents now wishing to be heard? Uh, Sarah, are there any opponents either in the room or in Zoom? Yes, we have, or sorry, we have opponents in the room and any opponents in Zoom, please use the raised hand button at this time or press star nine. We will start with the in the room opponents. First with Mr. Greg Holtzwart, followed by Barbara and James Chapman, then Ellen Peterson, Mike Mydell, and Todd Johnson. So first is Mr. Greg Holtzwart. You have three minutes. Please state and spell your name and state your address. Well, good afternoon. My name is Greg Holtzwart. I live at 6801 14th Avenue North in St. Petersburg. My home is directly east of the property in question. Unlike the other neighborhoods who have uh, avowed their support for this project, we are actually in sight of the land and in hearing distance of the land. Many of these other neighborhoods are over a mile away as far as their residents. My uh, objections are multiple, but I just want to talk about one very simple factor about this whole project. It's bike month. And today in the St. Petersburg time, you saw where we're unfortunately ranked as the eighth most dangerous metropolitan area for bikes and pedestrian accidents and fatalities. And I wanna talk about this project because it's adjacent to the bike trail and they're trying to sell it as a bike centric, bike uh, favoring project, which is a good idea, a good concept. But the reality is what they don't say is that this project is gonna generate, according to their own numbers, 7,886 car trips daily out of, this, out of this development. And the developers have promised us that all of the traffic is gonna funnel out towards 22nd Avenue, not through the neighborhood, even though there's nine curb cuts on this property that would allow traffic to filter into the neighborhood. So let's look at 22nd Avenue. It's a four lane highway. When you look at the proposed exit and entrance and turn to your right and look at 350 feet farther down the road, you come to the Pinellas County bike trail. It intersects 22nd Avenue, okay? Now, if you are at that intersection right now, it's guarded by the solar powered yellow warning lights that slow traffic and allow bike people and pedestrians to cross that traffic. But strangely enough, it's the only major highway on the south end of the bike trail that does not have a bike overpass and pedestrian overpass. And it also doesn't have the enhanced red light stoplights that exist on places like 28th Street South in St. Petersburg and 16th Street down near Tropicana Baseball Field. So it's really a very unguarded, and very chancy place to cross the trail. And I know this because I ride the trail every day. 
When you add 7,000 cars coming in and out of this property, and let's even assume generously that only half the cars are gonna turn right and they're gonna approach that bike uh, trail, you're, you're still talking about three to 4,000 cars on top of the current traffic right now. So something needs to be done. So if you're gonna approve this project, which I hope you don't, you're looking at a need for an overhead bike trail, an overpass. Is the county willing to bear the brunt of that cost and to put what will be needed? Or can you shift the responsibility to the Porter Development Group? And, and maybe as good stewards, they will do that. Okay, please don't approve this project. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Barbara and James Chapman. Please state and spell your names and state your address, and then you will have three minutes. My name, oops, sorry. My name is James Chapman. I live at 6800 16th Avenue North, St. Petersburg, Florida. I'm presently and have been the president of Crossroads Area Neighborhood Association for the past 10 years, and I'm speaking in opposition to the case CW21-06 Countrywide Amendment. For the past year, my association has discussed with Les Porter his Flume 60 application, which along with this countrywide map amendment and zoning change is an integral part of his plan to develop the 29.11 acre former Raytheon property in the city of St. Petersburg. In union with homeowners of Stone's Throw condominiums, Somerset Place condominiums, Crossroads homeowners, and even Azalea neighborhood homeowners, we have protested this development and its associated land use amendment and zoning change for the following reasons. 150,000 square foot, 300 by 500 by 48 foot tall, non-soundproofed alcohol selling complex, sports complex, which can double as an entertainment center for parties and social events catering to over a thousand people, has no business being erected in a residential neighborhood next to a large apartment complex, Crossroad Residential and Somerset Place homes. Nor does a 200 and 10,000 square foot, 300 by 700 foot open air water park lagoon, catering to an estimated 600 frolicking children, teenagers, and adults, which will be situated right in front of the one, two, three, and four story condominium homes of Sown Throws residents. N nor at least we forget the 16 10 by 20 refurbished shipping containers arrayed in a 285 foot row along the Pinellas Trail, which will sell food, alcohol, and retail merchandise to thirsty or hungry swimmers, travelers, and anyone who wishes to enter this unguarded, unfenced 29.11 acre property from the Pinellas County Trail 22nd Avenue and 72nd Street. Hmm, where's my other one? Uh, finally, I have to note in my last statement, there is a fence around the Water Park Lagoon, which will charge 25 bucks admission fee from each of the 600 prospective customers. Now, last but not least are the three apartment buildings containing 623 one and two bedroom apartments and an estimated 1,500 to 2,000 tenants. Now, Barbara, my co-president and wife, Lord and Master, will complete this length, late the presentation. However, what I'd like to clarify is that uh, Derek Kilborn did get a letter from uh, Dustin Estes. Three minutes, Rob. Can I complete that, by the way? He did get a letter from Dustin Estes, uh, who is- Please wrote, wrap it up. I'm sorry? Please wrap it up, All right. thank you. He's representing Stone Mount Financial, which is representing Amazon uh, Corporation, who wants to build on this property. Thank you. 842,000 Thank you, square, sir. Thank you. Well, I guess I'm gonna not wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you, people or members. Barbara, 
Member Shetman, would you like to speak as well? Did you do a separate comment? Yes, I do. If you could please state and spell your name, state your address, and you have three minutes. My name is Barbara Shatman. That's spelled S-C-H-A-T-T-M-A-N. I live at 6800 16th Avenue North, St. Petersburg, Florida. I am the wife of James Shatman. And I would also like to state that we have heard through Dustin Estes that they are Amazon is looking into the project, into building there too, but nobody seems to care about that. Um, anyway, let me continue with my, what we were talking about. Uh, I'm the wife of Jane Shatman, and I will tell you about the two exit entrances, one on 22nd Avenue and one on 72nd Street, and the exit, one exit only on 72nd Street through which all of the estimated 7,886 vehicles will enter and leave the 29.11 acres property every day, or the 25 mile per hour speed limit on the one dozen traffic calming speed humps, tree planted median islands and roundabout on the two lane 72nd Street, which is next to the Azalea Neighborhood Park, where hundreds of people go to play softball, football, basketball, soccer, tennis, and frisbee, or walk and jog daily on the one and a quarter mile sidewalk around the park. Or the fetid history of the Raytheon property as a 50 year dumping site of toxic chemicals which sank into the ground and then spread undetected for years into an underground plume which poisoned the aquifer beneath the surrounding azalea, brandywine, crosswords, stone throw, and Somerset Place homes. Or the outrage we feel at having our lives disrupted by an unwanted project and the daily invasion of thousands of people and vehicles that will bring crime, noise, traffic, pollution, and property damage to our beloved neighborhoods destroy our peace of mind, harm our families, and eviscerate the very value of our homes. But all of you hearing members know this already. If you have read the 186 comments emailed to Derek Kilborn and the documentation we have already supplied him with. Hearing members, have you read any of it? Have you visited the Raytheon site in person or talked with any of us? Well, have you? Thank you. Next, we have Ellen Peterson, followed by Mike Mydell and Todd Johnson. Please state and spell your name, state your address, and then you will have three minutes. Thank you. I'll just take this mask off for clarity. Um, my name is Ellen Peterson, and I bought into Stones Throw Circle North in 2018. I'm delighted to be here today because generally I live overseas with the U.S. State Department where I'm a public diplomacy officer in Cote d'Ivoire, but it is my full-time primary residence, and I had hoped to return there one day to be able to live there eventually. I can tell you that if this proposal goes through, I will be selling, as I think many of my neighbors will be. I'm delighted to be here today because I happen to be on vacation, and this coincides with my vacation time. So it's perfect because I've been seeing some of the information sort of leaking out over time. Um, I guess much like the tri trichloroethene and the vinyl chloride and the dioxines that are still in the soil, um, news has been leaking out. But apparently because of the class action lawsuit that took place in about 2011, um, the settlement enjoined um, the Homeowners Association of Stones Throw Circle and some other homeowners association from speaking out because we are... Uh, more than 300 linear feet from the property, we were not allowed to speak out um, uh, as a homeowners association and also because of the settlement. Um, rather, I sh let me restate that. The developer was not required to inform us because we're more than 300 linear feet from the entrance exit points. And because of the lawsuit, we're not allowed to, as a homeowners association, speak out. We're not the only homeowners association in that situation. 
you've all heard about the noise, you've heard about the traffic, you've heard about the minimal jobs creation at $28,000 a year jobs. These are not um, these are not the kinds of jobs that I would hope St. Petersburg is, is looking to, to, to create. Um, there's also the remediation of soils um, that is still ongoing. Um, I'm prepared to read a letter from Melanie Goodman if her, if her Zoom isn't working today. Um, with more details on the soil uh, remediation situation. But I think the real main thing is a water lagoon park at $25 a head, uh, bringing in thousands of people to hundreds of square feet of sports space when you have free, uh, free parks, free residential areas right nearby. The last thing I'd like to say is truly the photographs that I saw earlier don't do justice to kind of what is really a quiet residential area except for the commercial traffic next to us. This development would serve to drive that traffic right into the heart of our neighborhood. We don't need it, we don't want it you would see more people here today if word weren't ever so slowly leaking out to the neighbors. Um, we just hadn't heard of it, but I've been trying to follow it for the last few months, and it's, it's a bad, bad project, not only from an economic development point of view and a soils and environmental health point of view, but just traffic density, noise, speakers, beer. I don't need, you know, the, I don't need a county fair 100 feet from my doorstep. Thank you. Next, we have Mike Vidal, followed by Todd Johnson. Sarah, Mr. Vidal waves his remarks. Okay, next we have Todd Johnson, and then we will go to the people with raised hands in Zoom. You have three minutes. Please state and spell your name and state your address. Good afternoon, my name is Todd Johnson, uh, and I'm at 6916 Stones Throw Circle. And I live 300 feet from this property, um, and so do several other hundreds of residents are within that 500 feet area. Um, every day in the summer and spring, there's gonna be nonstop noise, and it's gonna disturb the peace and quiet of our residential area. Uh, when the lagoon isn't open in the winter, there's gonna be outdoor events, concerts, parties, weddings, loud music, shouting, screaming, PA systems. This is gonna be a major noise and disturbance and a congestion in our neighborhood and um, in this residential neighborhood. And uh, putting this project in a, on a contaminated site to me is ludicrous. Um, the number of jobs estimated aren't even gonna be close to near justifying the workforce housing. Um, do you think that people from the mall or from shoe stores uh, you know, on 22nd Avenue are gonna buy condos or rent in these developments. Um, and the government's gonna mandate uh, you know, minimum wage soon. That's gonna drive down the number of jobs as well. Um, I, I estimate it's gonna be probably two thirds of the 80 jobs that they say they're gonna create. Um, this project needs to be located at a place where there's hundreds of jobs not just 50 or so. Amazon and other companies have interest in this property and they're gonna bring a couple hundred high paying jobs, not just 80 or 100, I, I know that, with the trucks, with the people that work in the distribution center. Uh, also studies have recommended that other places much more desirable would be better for this uh, project uh, with better surroundings and where jobs are available justifying the workforce housing. Uh, looks to me that though there are glaring problems and tremendous negative reports that the city and council and commissions are choosing to just uh, push ahead through it. I don't know why that is. Um, and this to me is an amusement park that's gonna be uh, 300 feet from my balcony. And um, so uh, with, um, I've seen um, the homeowners associations uh, leaders stand up in favor of it while you know, the overwhelming majority of residents in these associations are against this. We have hundreds of people that have signed petitions against it. There are about a half a dozen reports negative saying it shouldn't be there. How can anyone think that uh, there's not some sort of, I don't know, um, I won't say. Uh, significant impact uh, in terms of jobs is not going to be there. It's gonna be an eyesore. Someone said that this, is gonna, this property is an eyesore. I look across, I see trees and grass, and it's a beautiful uh, view for me. And um, it's, um, if you've seen them, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, if you've seen Amazon, you know, they're gonna be going electric. Their trucks are not gonna be loud, and uh, there's gonna be hundreds of jobs. Uh, this site is obviously uh, desirable if Raytheon and Amazon wanted it. Um, the um, 250,000 square foot water park is gonna be outdoors. It's gonna be, have PA systems. Um, it's gonna be less than 500 feet from most people's homes. Um, my neighborhood does not, doesn't connect to the trail. 
uh, on purpose because there are bad elements on the trail at dark Excuse me. and they will float in and out minutes? of this space causing crime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's nobody else in the room. We have one person, an opponent with their hand raised in Zoom. Melanie Goodman, I'm going to allow you to speak. If you could unmute yourself and then state and spell your name and state your address, you'll have three minutes. Hello, my name is Melanie Goodman and I have been an owner and resident of Stone Throw Building 9 since 2004. I have some serious concerns about the noise level from developing a sports complex of this magnitude in a residential area without any proposed sound barriers, considering I work from home and I'm working on my master's degree online. I live under 100 feet from the proposed development, but my biggest concern are the chemicals that are still present in the ground. Building 9, which was and still is in the chemical plume, included chemicals such as trichloroethane, vinyl chloride, and 1,4-dioxane. According to the EPA, short-term and long-term inhalation exposure to trichloroethane can affect the central nervous system. Liver, kidney, immunological, endocrine, and developmental effects have also been reported in humans. Exposure has been associated with several types of cancers in humans, especially kidney, liver, cervix, and lymph nodes. The EPA also states that trichloroethene is moderately soluble in water and when present in the soil, has the potential to migrate into groundwater. According to the DEP Oculus report, location ETMW-02, or better known as the exact location for the new four acre water lagoon, contains 10 different chemicals way above the allowable EPA limits. The 1,4-dioxane reading was at 8,800 with the allowable EPA limit at 3.2. According to the correspondence between the DEP and Mr. Schultz, the recommendation was to install vapor barriers or passive venting in occupied structures. Stone's throw is already built. We cannot put vapor barriers into existing buildings. When the development begins, what does this mean for the residents that are currently living in the plume that do not have vapor barriers installed? As of the last soil and well sampling from June 2020, there are 31 locations significantly above the, uh, the EPA allowable limits for multiple chemicals at each location, and six of these with levels thousands of times the allowable limits. Location DMWJJ, which is right next to the stone throw maintenance shed, has seven chemicals reading in the thousands and two in the tens of thousands. The trichloroethylene level for this location was 18,000, with the allowable EPA limit at three. There is currently 1.8 million square feet of soil above the allowable limit for trichloroethylene and 5.4 million square feet of 1,4-dioxane contaminated soil in this area. That's five times the size of Tropicana Field. How can anyone in good conscience vote to approve anything to be built on this land with those current readings? Would you want your children swimming here or would you want to reside in this location? Thank you. Thank you. I see no other opponents in Zoom wishing to speak at this time. Thank you, Sarah. And now we will ask if there's any other citizens wishing to be heard. Are there any other citizens either in the room or in Zoom who wish to speak? I see no other citizens in the room wishing to speak on this item. Any other citizens wishing to speak in Zoom, please use the raise hand button or press star nine on your phone. We do have one other citizen wishing to speak, uh, Colin, ending in number 98. I'll allow you to speak at this time. If you could unmute yourself, state and spell your name and state your address, you have three minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Casey Crane. I spoke earlier about my concerns, but I did have to ask one very important question. Um, one of the neighborhood association presidents said that he had unanimous support from all of his residents. However, if you look at the list, there are people on that list who do not support it, who have spoken out against it. And there are a number of people that I've spoken with online through next door who say that they never saw or heard of any announcement about a vote for this project. So my question is, how were they informed or made aware ahead of time that this project was going to even be voted on within their neighborhoods? So how could they have unanimous support if they weren't aware of it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
I see no other citizens wishing to speak on this item. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you to everyone who um, spoke today in our public hearing. Uh, yes, Chelsea. Sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to uh, recommend allowing the opportunity for rebuttal if the uh, property owner or the local government uh, so desires. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, we have an opportunity now for a rebuttal from the property owner. If the property owner would, or a representative would like to address Any questions or concerns? And we have Derek Kilborn. Hello again, Derek Kilborn, manager of the city of St. Petersburg Urban Planning Historic Preservation. I, I really just want to make uh, two, two quick comments. The first comment is um, there was a reference to the development agreement and it's uh, absolutely correct that in the development agreement, there is a statement, uh, line 31, that has a uh, <coughs> essentially a reverter clause opportunity so that if the project does not go forward, the city retains the right to proceed with a rezoning and future land use map amendment back to the existing. And I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking of that earlier. We try to anticipate in our minds all the questions you're gonna ask, and that was one I wasn't ready for but it is in the development agreement, line 31. The other thing is you've heard um, a reference to uh, the term amusement park and how that might be interpreted. I know this is a county level map amendment. It is not a local site plan that you are considering today, but um, for the purpose of your consideration of what you've heard, whether it's an amusement park or a recreation facility, a sports recreation facility, and our local codes and ordinances, those are all referred to as commercial recreation indoor and commercial recreation outdoor. In the case of the indoor sports recreation facility, that is already today a permitted use under the industrial suburban category. And the commercial recreation outdoor, the Crystal Lagoon that you've heard referenced, is a special exception use as a commercial recreation outdoor. So those are activities that could happen on the site today under the existing zoning. Um, under the package of considerations that you're hearing, uh, the housing element is something that is not allowed under the existing zoning. And uh, the workforce housing element, which is part of that, again, is uh, critical to us for this application moving forward but it's also important to the city's overall uh, economic and workforce development initiatives in trying to provide housing opportunities for the employees that um, are working here in the community. So that was the only two points I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and board members. I really appreciate um, all your time this afternoon. I know this is a uh, very complicated matter, and I know that it's taken a lot of time. This is, I think, our eighth hour of hearings uh, between the CPPC, uh, the City Council, and now uh, for Pinellas, actually, if you include the pack, it might be 10 hours. Um, and all of these issues, I want you to remember and understand, have been thoroughly vetted and deliberately designed by both the city staff, the city attorney's office, and also with the two out of the three neighborhood associations. One thing I wanted to emphasize is that my client and the city have proactively worked with all of the neighbors. My client has literally responded to over 100 written questions from Mr. Chapman in detail, and those are in the record. The city has also responded to significant written questions from all of the people that you've heard speak, you know, as represented by Mr. Chapman. Every issue from traffic to environmental has been addressed and is being thoroughly considered. As you know, this is not site plan approval. Almost everything you've heard against the application from the public today are site plan related issues. So once the development, if the development agreement is approved and if the land use is approved contingent upon the development agreement, we will then go back to the St. Petersburg DRC, which is a public hearing for site plan approval. We will need fully engineered plans. We will need a traffic impact study. We will need a noise mitigation plan. So a project of this magnitude in St. Petersburg, over and above the city's already in place noise ordinance, 
requires a written noise mitigation plan that will be tangible and will be in the hands of the decision makers in the city. I want you to understand this sports tourism facility is indoor only. There are no outdoor fields. There are no public address systems. There are no amplified music. There's no amplified noise. The Crystal Lagoon is a passive beach area. It's not a water park. There's no water features. There's no tidal wave pool. There's no slides. It is a open public pool with a beach area. It will have normal hours of operation. All of that will be thoroughly addressed by the city staff in the site plan approval process. What's before you today is whether you agree with the Planning Advisory Council and the city that this meets the requirements for economic development. We've already addressed that at length, but remember, 17 million in tourism dollars per year, $50,000 annual average salary, Mr. Sullivan informs me, for the full-time employees, about 100 full-time equivalent jobs, and up to 187 sorely needed workforce housing units in market rate development, in market rate development. Mr. Pergolese is gonna address very briefly the traffic concerns that were raised. Uh, Robert Pergolizzi, again, for the record. Um, according to the Forward Pedellas 2019 level of service report, the uh, arterial roadways in this area, 22nd Avenue, 66th Street, and Park Street are all operating at level of service C or D. Our main access would be to 22nd Avenue North at a meeting opening. We have side access to 72nd Street because 72nd Street has a signalized intersection at 22nd Avenue North, which then provides safe and efficient access for people to turn left, to head out toward Park Street, and then get back to the beaches uh, where they can spend their dollars at their hotels. Uh, Again, workforce housing generally generates fewer trips and, in, uh, and spurs transit, uh, transit usage. I want to uh, also refer to Mr. Chapman's uh, assertion that traffic would be going through his neighborhood east of the Pinellas Trail. 22nd Avenue runs east and west the whole width of the county. However, 13th Avenue North, which is at the southern border of Azalea Park, dead ends at the Pinellas Trail and then picks up again east of the trail and goes out to 66th Street, which is where the Crossroads neighborhood is. So we can't have traffic. There would be no traffic running along 13th Avenue North through Mr. Shatman's neighborhood. The major east-west roadway is 22nd Avenue North, which has plenty of capacity left as the city staff uh, uh, report uh, for their city council hearing uh, demonstrated. And now I'll uh, answer any questions you have on that or turn it back to Brian. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chelsea, are we okay to proceed with closing the public hearing? I'll come up this time. Okay. Uh, yes. The um, last part of the procedure would be staff closing up to five minutes if you, okay. if you so desire and need. Okay, would forward. I have a procedural, question. Have a procedural yes. question. If the staff's closing, do they continue to be able to answer questions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. If, if anyone I just has know a that we haven't, we, the Once. full board hasn't had a chance to ask questions, so I wasn't sure if they wanted to wait to do their closing or whatever. Okay. okay. We're going to have the five minute closing, close the public hearing, and then go to board discussion, and we can ask or bring up anyone to ask questions. Okay. All right. Hello. Hello again, everyone. Again, Narsine Arman with Board Pinnell staff. This has been a long one. I know that you have heard a lot of information, a lot of um, intricate details. And as a reminder for both myself as staff and for you as board members, what we are considering today is the amendment, the change from the employment designation to the multimodal corridor designation. And I know that sometimes it can be um, easy to fall into that hole of asking the intricate detailed questions about the site plan. But we are considering the designation away from employment to the multimodal corridor category and also considering how this amendment fares with our countywide rules and the considerations that we must balance against. So to summarize, this proposed amendment converts away from the employment category on a site that we as staff and also the Pinellas County Economic Development have considered appropriate and suitable for continued industrial and employment uses. The primary proposed use of this amendment is a sports tourism facility along with other ancillary uses, but 
Still, sports tourism cannot be considered a target employment industry as outlined by the defined uh, um, criteria in the countywide rules. And while this definition of target employment can be perceived to be open-ended, target employment uses specifically mention above average wages. And based on materials submitted by the applicant that we have record, this proposed use does not surpass that average annual wage identified by Pinellas County Economic Development of $48,901 annually. In the interest of maintaining and creating target employment opportunities for the economic vitality of our county, our countywide rules emphasizes the reservation of employment designated lands. And again, we as staff do not find this proposed amendment to meet this criteria and recommend denial of this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Nusheen. Um, with that, um, I believe now we will conclude the public hearing and we'll go to board discussion and questions. And at that time, board members may bring up any of the uh, speakers who are here today to ask to clarify any questions or comment. So um, we'll go with Commissioner Seal, then Council Member Gabbard. Um, so my fellow city of St. Petersburg ladies, um, I do have a couple questions for you on mm -hmm. kind of the history. I've been looking at the property appraiser's website. I've looked at the history, remembering the history of the proper property over the years in the plume. Um, I did look at the listing. It's listed for $13,250,000, which is $450,000 an acre. I just thought you might find that interesting. Um, it looks like in 2015 it sold for eight million. Um, so I, I just just mentioned that as just being interesting facts. Um, so in reading back in 2015, it sounded like the buyer was trying to work with the neighborhood to come forth with acceptable uses for the property. So what happened between 2015 and today? Do you, is there any that, that you all recall that there's any movement on the property or? If, if you don't mind, Commissioner Seal, um, I'm gonna bring up Derek Kilborn from the okay. city of St. Pete to address that. I know those years were before uh, uh, Council Member Gabbard was even elected and um, I don't seem to recall or know off the top of my head what's been going on. Because one of the, an article and that, was, that I found showed that the developer was starting to meet with the neighborhood to discuss what were acceptable uses. And sure. so I'm just really curious, you know, because we've looked at different properties of this size and having to try to decide whether it ever can be really truly developed as an industrial property, practically speaking. Mm -hmm. right. um, so in that regard, and I asked a question earlier, how long has this really been actively marketed and has there been other interested parties beyond what this one right. letter that you indicated? In the, uh, so in the last five years, there have been several inquiries on this property that have come into our planning office. Um, typically those inquiries though, there are two uh, ones that I personally sat in on the development of the inquiry and, and where they were trying to go with their proposal. Both of those were mostly multifamily. And they were what? Both of those were mostly multifamily. Okay. So we had uh, the first one that came in around that time period that you're referring to was a 100%, nearly 100% multifamily residential proposal that took up the entire balance of the property, incl including over the contaminated southern portion of the site. Um, we met with them and explained to them all the challenge that, challenges that you've heard about today especially in that example, because it did not have the employment or job generating um, component that this particular application does have. So um, as time passed, that project went away. Uh, I am not certain for what reasons it, it went away, but there was then a amended proposal that came in from a different developer. Again, multifamily residential. Um, their proposal was to uh, bifurcate the property, take the northern half of the site, and then develop the northern half of the site with 100% multifamily residential. So the only inquiries 
that we have seen in our planning office were for nearly 100% residential. And I say nearly because there's a frontage to 22nd Avenue, Tyrone Malls across the street. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, there were, I think some proposals to do some very small accessory commercial frontage on the ground floor facing 22nd because they thought that that's what our department uh, wanted to see in their plan. Um, but it was a little short in that they weren't thinking about the larger implications of how to get through a process moving that land from industrial or employment to something else. And in their cases, it was multifamily residential only. And that's why this plan has been treated a little differently by our office. And especially with the uh, development agreement and the requirement to provide that commercial employment opportunity first and the workforce housing provision at 30%. Uh, but that's why we looked at this one a little differently than those other ones. Okay. Um, and I know where some of your city pools are located, but if you were going to compare this to say some of your city pools, are some of them surrounded by residential neighborhoods? I mean, as close as some of these folks would be? Yes, uh, the pools are located at the city's recreation facilities and those are embedded into the heart and center of many of our single family residential areas. And so, yes, absolutely. And my final question for you, and thank you very much, mm -hmm. is um, the um, applicant did not mention, but indicated on the site review process that they would discuss hours of operation. Do you have any idea what those might be? Uh, hours of operation, I do not know. I can certify for you that everything that was just presented to you in those comments about process was accurate. So uh, when the site plan comes forward, it would have to go for public hearing review to our development review commission and everything that they indicated would be reviewed is part of that process related to traffic analysis, noise, uh, all the things that were just itemized that you heard, I can certify for you is correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're going to go to Council Member Gabbard, and then we have uh, Commissioner Gerard and Commissioner Eggers in the queue. Madam Chair, could you please put me on the list? I've been yep. trying. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess my first question might be for Nasheen. So in just looking at the what's before us today and understanding you know the concern with changing um does it make a difference to you as staff and and all of the decision making that there is the provision in the development agreement that if this project is not ultimately approved that there is a re a reversion clause does that make any difference whatsoever Based on what's in front of us today, even without the development agreement, the mm -hmm. proposed use is a sports tourism facility, mm -hmm. and our answer would still be that of, to recommend denial because okay. that does not fall under the target employment opportunities outlined in our rules. And I certainly understand that. I guess for me, the fact that that clause exists does give me a little bit less heartburn with it um, because it, it can always be reverted back if that does not go through. Um, is that correct, Mr. Kilborn? Just to reiterate, I think you've reiterated it once, but. Oh, yeah. It is, and since we're talking about it, maybe I should just actually read it yeah. um, in its draft form. So I think I might've said line 31, it's actually line 30. Failure of development to occur as proposed, period. If development of the property does not occur as proposed under this agreement, both the city and the property owner have the right to initiate the process to change the land use and zoning designations of the property to the designations that existed at the time of execution of this agreement, period. Okay. And that's the end of that. That's the clause that we're referring to. Okay, thank you. 
that certainly helps to uh, take care of that concern for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a question uh, for the developers, and I don't know who on the team wants to actually take it, but I do have concern about the large disparity between what the county is calculating as the average wage and what the average wage target is. So can you speak to that a little bit more? Again, my name is Eric Sullivan with the Sports Facilities Companies. Um, related specifically to that, I brought my computer up here because it's a robust feasibility study with a number of uh, details in it. When we look at the full-time jobs created, as I mentioned, there's over uh, 20 full-time jobs created at the management coordinator and director level positions. These range from a general management position that is over uh, six figures in salary, with the average of those 20 plus jobs being right around $50,000 uh, in annual salary. So that's just in wages, not in bonus, taxes, payroll benefits. Um, as it relates to the remainder of the staff, the dozens and dozens of seasonal part-time uh, staff, what that will be consistent of is, if you imagine we only have staff during certain program times. So for example, if it's a basketball coach, they're not there during a cheer program. If it's a you know volleyball official, they're not there during a, another use. So what you'll find is that all of the wages that are built out into the detailed analysis, similar to the work that we did with the county, are based on the specific jobs that will create uh, the seasonality of those jobs and then also the full-time position. So I think the disparity is that when the staff looked at it, they basically took the total uh, number of uh, wages that we would pay and then divided that by the full-time equivalent and that's just not an accurate depiction of full-time staff, seasonal staff, and then very specific direct expenses or cost of goods sold staff. Okay, okay, that helps. And then um, you mentioned a number from your economic study that would be kind of the, the total when everything was realized of what the economic impact to the area would be. Could you remind us of that number? Yeah, on an annual basis, that would be uh, up to $17 million in direct economic benefit. And what's okay. important to understand with that number is that's not a number that we create. That's a number that's based on uh, visit St. Pete Clearwater, um, the average daily rate, average daily expenditure of people that come to our market that wouldn't be here if not but for events at the venue. So that's direct economic impact. It doesn't uh, identify the indirect economic benefit, which is ex exceptionally more than that, as well as job creation during construction. So those are two other considerations. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gerard. Uh, just to couple of thoughts. I don't think I have any more questions. Um, I guess I wonder if people were talking about how contaminated the site might still be, and I, I have to wonder why it would be better to have a residential and recreational use there than an industrial use, but um, that's neither here nor there. At, you know, defending the county's industrial lands is part of my job. Um, and we take it pretty seriously at the county level. Um, we've looked at some properties before where we had to, um, well, we didn't have to, but we were asked to um, change the land use on a piece of property that was sitting dormant for a long time. The times that we've done that, there there have been pieces of land that were too small to do anything on, that were not in a good area, that they didn't have good transportation options. Um, they were not adjacent to other industrial lands. Um, so I have some real problem changing this, especially given what, what Mike was talking about before, our Penny for Pinellas projects with the uh, incentives for uh, industrial or target employment projects. Um, I think that increases the likelihood it, as well as all the, um, the remediation that's gone on on this property for 20 years. Uh, I think there's much more opportunity in the future. We're just now looking at the first round of applications for that money. 
I mean, just in the last month. Uh, so I'd like to give it more time to work. I think, like Mike said, industrial is not, um, you know, concrete crushing plants anymore. It's things that you could look at a building and not have any idea what was going on in there based on uh, the outside of the building or the noise level or the number of cars coming in and out. Um, and this county needs high wage jobs. We don't need a whole lot more service industry jobs, uh, although we need the ones back that we just lost in the last year. Um, you know, I don't think we need to be attracting the kind of um, jobs that would be offered here. Part-time and uh, seasonal jobs are not what we are wanting to attract. So that's where I'm at with it. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Eggers, and then we'll go to Commissioner Long, and then Vice Mayor Alberton. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Mike, if you could maybe get up to the microphone. Um, yeah, my, my concern, I, I share some of the thoughts that um, Commissioner Gerard just spoke about, and that is protecting our industrial land. Um, when you have a property that's sold for $8 million, you're you're getting, again, I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but somewhere around $5 a square foot for land. For industrial land, it makes some sense. At the one that's li if it's listed at $13 million, I don't know what the contract is for now, but you know, you're over $10 a square foot. It almost, it, it begs entitlements. It begs more entitlements for the land to make financial sense of the project and kind of prices industrial out almost. And again, I'm, it's a relative thing. I mean, these numbers may not be exactly right, but it's relative to that. And so, uh, Mike, maybe you could talk a little bit to this jobs, this direct economic impact of industrial over the ones that have been talked about today on the other side. You know, Certainly, the yeah. the, uh, happy to do that. The, um, the calculation of the 2.6 to 3.5 million dollars in total salaries divided by 100 full-time equivalent employees is exactly how we calculate our average industrial wage as well and the average wage for the county as a whole. So taking the total payroll of the county and dividing it by the number of workers in the, in the county, we end up with that 48,195 figure. So if you take all wages of all kinds, part-time and full-time of everybody in this county and you divide it out per capita, it is significantly higher than the average wages of these 100 full-time equivalent jobs. You look at manufacturing as a category countywide, the average wage is $58,000 per year for all manufacturing wages divided by all manufacturing employees. So that's, that's how we would calculate and look at that situation. So it, it's your assertion that the, the economic benefit or direct economic benefit of these types of jobs to the community is higher than the alternative. Absolutely, and then if you also look at the uh, gross domestic product that is generated by manufacturing firms, that contribution to GDP is three times what it is for hospitality industries. So the manufacturing GDP contribution versus hospitality GDP contribution, three times the value. That's money coming into this economy. So yes, uh, tourism brings money into the economy, but not nearly at the level of manufacturing. And maybe we could just talk a little bit, um, and, I, and I know that the applicant, I think, probably would like to address this as well, but I've heard about the environmental concerns, and I know, I know we're here really dealing with the, the, the category change, um, mm -hmm. but, but as it relates to industrial versus the other uses, the residential and that kind of thing, how do you see this playing out? I mean, is is the company that owns it now going to be on the hook for the environmental aspect of that for years to come? Or does that transfer to the new property owner? Um, and um, I've, I've, been, yeah, hearing no, different, I've in, been hearing different yeah, the, things. The, the lawyers can speak to it, but, but Raytheon will be on the hook forever because okay. they are the known cause and they still exist as a corporation today. So they, they will bear the lion's share so of any those future. issues I've heard from both sides are going to be there for, for years to come. Yes. And whoever is there is going to be dealing with that Correct. ramification, whatever that might, however that might exhibit, uh, show itself. Yes. Um, 
Okay. So the environmental concerns, um, um, less less of a concern under the industrial versus the other. And your th your thoughts on that? Well, definitely. I mean, you can see in cases like the Stouffer Chemical Site, the Superfund Site in uh, north of Tarpon Springs, north of the Anclote River, and in our own Star Center property. Um, that again, uh, the G GE and uh, basically the Department of Energy is the is the party that's on the hook for that cleanup. But in both of those cases, there are restrictions, covenant restrictions on the property that you cannot do residential on that property. And it's typical for a highly contaminated property to have such restrictions to industrial uses. And again, as was mentioned, it's great to have a non-permeable cover over that to reduce the amount of rainwater leaching through it. And that is typical of an industrial site as well. And you don't have the interaction of the groundwater um, with, with um, residential. And in fact, uh, the, um, the Stouffer property does not allow transitional um, housing either, like uh, hotels and other lodging uses. So it's, it's restricted away from that. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, and I don't know if anybody on the applicant side wanted to speak to that, to that in the, in the, um, the, you know, the, pollu the polluted state, if you will, of the ground um, as it relates to um, ongoing issues, ongoing problems, and how that's going to affect the user at the property. Yeah. Again, um, Greg Schultz with Cardno, uh, 380 Park Place Boulevard, Clearwater, Florida. I think the uh, one of the differences between the sites that were identified with restrictions and the, the site that we're looking at, the Raytheon property, is to my understanding, those facilities have soil contamination that lends themselves to restricting a, a land use to either industrial or residential because of direct exposure concerns, someone coming in contact with the top two feet of soil. That's not the case at the Raytheon facility. The impacts at the facility are groundwater related, and in fact, they're primarily in the deeper aquifer zones. The contaminants that were released at Raytheon, um, if you think about it, were somewhat similar to Drano when you pour it into your sink. It, it sinks down to the bottom to the clog. These type of chemicals are heavier than water, and they typically sink in the aquifer. So the majority of the impacts, while there are some localized uh, impacts in the source area that are shallow, the majority, by and large, are in the deeper aquifers. So um, the development plan currently calls for residential on the northern half of the property. And that's the area that was not within the primary source of the plant operations. So, you know, that has no impacts from the, the groundwater contamination as the plume is heading uh, to the south. So that's why the development plan has been set up the way it is and the site plan to focus residential in the, in the least impacted potential areas of the site. Okay. I hope Thank that you. answered your question. Yeah, I d I, yeah, it does. I mean, whether it's actual or perceived, I think there's going to be some concerns. Right, and that's part of the reason, yeah. actual or perceived, is part of the reason we, we've included vapor barriers under, uh -huh. under the uh, apartments. Um, yeah, is because of the perception of you know significant ca contamination. You know, we wanted to make sure we were going above and beyond for the safety. And I did want to point out that we've been working hand in hand with FDEP on this. Um, we've uh, had several meetings with them, and you know everything that we're doing is in a cooperative manner with with FDEP, and they are approving all of our actions and all you know all of our plans as we go forward. So we're not doing anything outside of what would get the environmental approvals from the state. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, we'd like to just address uh, briefly the uh, question that Commissioner Eggers asked regarding uh, the industrial versus uh, this proposal and um, the marketability questions. But I did want to point out that the relevant uh, countywide rule that we're looking at today is 6.54.4 which is conversion criteria for employment related categories and uses. And there are three criteria to evaluate. Again, this is legislative, so it's based on your rational basis, your opinion of whether these are met. Number one is target employment opportunities and the extent to which this proposed mixed use, which brings your economic development tourism dollars and brings 100 equivalent full-time jobs, is a target, you know, it provides for that opportunity. And I'd like to remind you that the definition of target employment in the countywide rules is not exclusive. It is not exclusive, it's inclusive, including but not limited to, and that's to allow you to make this decision. And that's to allow the county commissioners to make that decision on a case by case basis. Uh, the second criteria is amendment site characteristics. 
And that's where we think this, and this is where the city, I think, totally agrees. This site has sat dormant and vacant for 15 to 20 years. And the only serious proposals that have come forward, the only serious and real proposals have been for 100% market rate multifamily, which doesn't meet any of the criteria that the city's looking for or any of the criteria that the county's looking for. And so what we've brought is, again, many, 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 many months and resources and dollars of developing this plan to meet these criteria. But the amendment site characteristics do not make it marketable or feasible to bring the type of industrial use that the county is looking for. And Mr. Sullivan's gonna address that. And then the third uh, criteria, again, amendment area characteristics, the extent to which the uses within the current or proposed category relate to surrounding and nearby uses and plan classifications, including their compatibility with such uses and plan classifications. And I think that's where you have, again, significant agreement with the city and the city staff that Azalea Park would be much better served by activating the Pinellas Trail, bringing a bike trail through this property to 72nd, and the single family homes, and even the multifamily homes in the activity center, who the opponents are live in an activity center, which is important to consider. This is a much better transition between Azalea Park and the trail than an Amazon distribution center. And that's our opinion, and that appears to be the opinion of the city staff. And that is an important piece for you to consider because it's in the criteria of the countywide rules for you to consider. Mr. Sullivan, just very briefly, if you could follow up on that. Yeah, absolutely. As far as the marketability, Eric Sullivan Sports Facilities Companies, I think the, the key, the reason we get hired uh, time and time again all around the country is because of the way that these can impact communities which they serve. And what I mean by that is there's two trends that you'll all have heard of that are very, very common, very prevalent, and communities are actively seeking out. And for one, on the tourism front, that's play and stay destinations. People want to go to a destination where they can have a great experience, not just on the court, um, but also with their families, with the siblings, outside and off the, uh, the campus as well. So when you think about the proximity to the beaches, our beach hotels, downtown St. Pete, the St. Pete attractions, and all the attractions throughout the county, we think from a play and stay perspective, this has extreme marketability. Um, and I, I know that the St. Pete Clearwater uh, Commission agrees with that as well. When you think about the second trend that this has, just extreme marketability from a, a mass appeal, it's with the live, work, play. So whether you talk about um, young, active families, whether you talk about the um, current active workforce, you talk about the urbanization of seniors, there's a huge trend that people want to live in places where they can play, they can recreate, they can really celebrate a healthy and well uh, fit type experience in their communities. And so from those perspectives, we think there's just extreme marketability to uh, this site and this project. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have uh, just a couple of comments and also a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, there was, a, I believe it was a gentleman that spoke and was curious about whether or not any one of us had ever actually been in the neighborhoods and or uh, knew about the Raytheon issues there in that community. and. In a former chapter of my life, I would like to share for the benefit of the members here that uh, I, I spent many days in that Raytheon plant and worked feverishly with the neighborhood and the associations around the Raytheon plant during the um, plume that was discovered and can share with you that millions of dollars have been spent to remediate the toxic plume. And I learned in that uh, effort that it, when you have that kind of a accident that happens, it takes decades, decades before it is totally, totally remediated. That said, uh, Raytheon has done a spectacular job, in my opinion, of trying to remediate that area the new technologies that had been developed back then and continue being developed now, taking advantage of the new things that are learned every day, have helped even more to remediate the plume. So I think it goes without saying that in both my legislative life and my county commission life, that area has been in my district as well as 
it's in Commissioner Gerard's as well. So my point here being that that land has been vacant for a very long time. There have been many opportunities to market it to no avail. And while I appreciate the comments made by Commissioner Gerard and agree with her totally that as a county commissioner, it is one of our many responsibilities to protect our industrial lands. I really like this project uh, for a variety of reasons that it fulfills in my mind several of the major criteria that the county is focused on in terms of affordable housing, our transportation initiatives that work in consort with affordable housing because it picks people up and takes them to jobs. And it also, uh, for me, um, Sustainability and resiliency is a really, really big deal. And I thought it was uh, very impressive, the poster boards that Mr. Ox had to show us today of what the project might look like. I, I do have a couple of concerns that I would like to see addressed as this moves forward through the different processes. And to that point, what is the next step with the for this project. Let's pretend that today we pass it out of forward Pinellas. What would be the next step? You'd be making a recommendation to the countywide planning authority or, uh, as the Board of County Commissioners and to then, act on that recommendation. And then uh, upon that basis, it would go back to the city of St. Petersburg. And then? They would negotiate a site plan. Okay, and then? Does it come back to the county commission or no? No. No? No. All right, so it sounds to me that given that we passed it today, it still has several stops to go before it's finally a done deal. And I do think there were some concerns raised by the neighborhood that could be a little more thoroughly addressed, um, such as the transportation component the um, contamination issues, I think, it, you know, having more of a focus on that might be really important. And um, um, and I think that's about all I have to say. I just think that it's an opportunity to address our families and our, our uh, kids and I don't know that there are too many adverse effects that come from involving families and children in sports. So that's all I have to say on that issue. I would like to, I would like to see it move forward. Thank you. Um, we're gonna go to Vice Mayor Albritton and uh, Mayor Bajowski. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, you know, Clearwater just went through something kind of in reverse. We went, we just had a, uh, a uh, going from a, a uh, green uh, recreation area to a uh, light industrial. And I was, I supported that project because it was, it had a big economic value for Clearwater and also brought in a lot of jobs. Uh, but listening to this, and I, I understand this is a legislative process today, and we're not really, we're not really voting on the project itself, but we're voting on the the change of uh, amendment from employment to multimodal corridor, which could make this project possible. But it's kind of the first step toward uh, many more. Uh, public hearings and um, planning has to, it's got to go through a lot more process. Um, but again, I, you know, this is going to bring jobs. It's going to bring economic benefit. And, um, and we're talking workforce, ho workforce housing, which we're all talking about. Yep. All our municipalities in the county, and it's very important in our community for that. Uh, the other thing is it's a very problematic dormant property. It's been that way for years. This is a, this, this somebody's coming with a viable 
idea for it. So because there's a reverter clause uh, that is in it, that if the project fails, it'll go back, I'm tending to lean toward approving this and uh, letting the first part of this happen and see where it goes. Okay. Thank you. And um, Mayor Bajowski, and then we'll go to Vi Vice Mayor Mertz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know there are a lot of concerns and a lot of different levels here. Um, but really what our role is, is advisory, and what our role is, is to determine um, what the countywide comp plan and all of those different things say and what leeway we have. That's the role that we're giving advice on. <coughs> I say that because the city of St. Petersburg are the folks that are going to determine all the traffic issues, that are going to determine the um, environmental issues, they're going to determine whether this is the type of project that fits in this neighborhood or not. Um, all we're doing um, is saying, look, we either see or don't see a reason to change the countywide map. My concern is that this property has been sitting for 20 years with nothing. That's my concern. I'm not saying this project is right. I might even have concerns myself about the project itself. I'm just concerned about 20 years of something sitting, but yet we still think all of a sudden a magic manufacturing thing is going to come up. I'm not sure that's going to happen. If it hasn't happened in 20 years, I'm not even with an incentive program. Um, and I do think there is perception as to access to main, main roads. Even though you might say it's four miles away, there's a perception that it's a lot longer. Um, that's my concern. And I, I feel that way because I've had this issue in my own city. Dave will tell you, we had the Nielsen property that sat empty for years. We had to ask for a change because nobody wanted it. Why? Because it didn't have access to major roads. It was a big reason. It wasn't the only reason. Um, now we're getting ready to have Coca-Cola. If that Coca-Cola property sits empty for 20 years, I would be like wanting to jump off a bridge. <laughs> that would kill me. So I, I, I feel like 20 years is a really long time, and I do understand everything everybody said. I absolutely believe in preserving jobs. My hope is that we're going to bring in jobs to our Coca-Cola property. I don't want to see residents there. I want to see jobs. Um, but, you know, what do they say? You've got to have a willing buyer and a willing seller. We have a willing seller, but we haven't had a willing buyer or a willing developer. I think we have to, so in my mind, I just think 20 years is long enough. So I'm, I'm going to support it only because I know it's got to go to the county commission. They're going to listen to everything that we've had to say here. They're going to weigh all of this before they make their final vote. Um, and again, knowing that the development agreement has those caveats, again, for me, it is not about approving the project. It is only about the land, the countywide map. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Mers. Uh, thank you. Um, I very much appreciate all the depth of discussion. There's a lot out. Um, I, I was happy to hear of this new program um, being discussed with penny money. Um, obviously, there's a number of industrial pieces of property that have been sitting for a while. Um, I've always been on the side of trying to protect industrial lands basically for the type of um, jobs that they provide, the, the, the salaries, the, the long-term employment that usually comes with it. And, and, the, and I also appreciate and the position that the, the um, Forward Pinellas staff um, provided when they provided such a detailed and, I think, 
um, sound analysis. It, it was very logical, very well applied to me. I also um, appreciate Mike Mydell's uh, comments as well. Um, I understand that the discussion here is primarily pertaining to the change away from employment to multimodal quarter. Um, the, the idea that you're losing a, a very large piece of industrial land concerns me. Um, I understand the discussion of smaller pieces in various locations. Um, I have one question, um, and Madam Chair brought it up initially, about the discussion that since we are now greater than five acre piece, the change in the map, is the change in the map then allow for other larger parcels than five acres to, autom to automatically be considered for this type of thing? Um, I, I would hate to have something here because this is greater than five acres, so we're changing the map that would then inadvertently open up other larger pieces of industrial property that the few that, that still remain. So to clarify, is your question regarding other properties aside from this? Well, just general properties. You know, what if we opened this up because of the fact that now five acres was the limit and we had to mm -hmm. open this up, right? Does that open, allow then, is, is that a, a change that it's no longer five acres, but it, it, it allows for um, a larger acreage property, any property in the future. That really depends on the property and the submittal um, being put, put in front of us. Um, the employment category has specific acreage limitations depending on the uses. It just so happens that the commercial recreation use is limited to that acreage of five acres maximum. It doesn't necessarily mean it applies to any other property around the county. That would really depend on the property that we're talking about and the proposed use of that property. Just in the case of this amendment, because the commercial recreation use is limited to five acres and because this proposed use falls under the commercial recreation use, the proposed amendment is put in front of us. So it's done on a one by one basis? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, a couple of people have said that this, you know, they want to vote for this so that it keeps moving forward. My question is, is if this is, if this was turned down by the PPC, that's the recommendation going forward to the county commission. So it's going forward whether we pass it or not um, to the county commission. And I, and again, I just, from from my perspective. Whether if it passes here, it comes when it, when it comes to the countywide planning authority. Excuse me, um, that we have a lot more discussion uh, about about the timing of the sale of this property and why it's moved or why it hasn't moved. Uh, about the employment status, uh, the employment. Uh, excuse me, the types of jobs that this brings and the economic impact. I want to see more of that detail because, to me, I, I continue to say we, we've had these arguments about pieces of land in this county going to parks or to, you know, to other needs or environmental lands, et cetera. And it's really critical in a county that's totally built out that we carefully balance the needs for the affordable housing component, the environmental lands and stormwater, and industrial and jobs and more of them and higher paying. It goes to people getting those opportunities, but it also goes towards raising that you know, that percent AMI. So if you're in an 80%, you're getting higher jobs, you're now probably going to be bumped up to 90 or 100%. The jobs and more jobs and higher paying jobs makes a big difference in this county. And every piece of industrial land can be argued out based on land cost. Uh, we can raise the property value so high that, uh, because it's such demand here um, that, that we won't have industrial lands. So we have to be careful. I just want to be ultra careful and that's why I won't support it today. I do want to get more information as it comes forward uh, later. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? I know I'd like to say something before we, before we wrap up. Okay, I'm seeing no hands or eye contact. Yes, Chelsea. 
<laughs> just a couple of things, if I may, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, uh, based on some of the comments I heard, I just wanted to clarify, by way of the development agreement, um, the board is able to take that into consideration with their decision-making process. However, just as the same relates to the countywide uh, rules and considerations in the rules. Um, there is a mechanism in the rules um, to make the development agreement um, coupled with the amendment, but the development agreement is not in a form to allow that to happen. It's in draft form. It's not finalized, did not, you know, executed or anything of that matter. Um, with those things being said, um, if you were to approve, uh, or recommend approval of this, I would recommend that um, it not be contingent upon, as PAC recommended, um, a workforce housing guarantee uh, or the uh, draft development agreement um, at this time. I think that that's uh, more appropriate at the local level. And then uh, as far as reversion, uh, back to the land use and zoning that existed previous to the development agreement, if the development agreement were to uh, terminate, I just wanted it to be clear that at the countywide level, the countywide land use map will still remain the same. There'll have to be a subsequent process to uh, undo the countywide um, amendment. So just mm -hmm. want to make that clear. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Chelsea. Um, so, I'm honestly torn uh, on this issue. On one hand, this land has been vacant for a very long time, and I don't want to send a message um, that the city is difficult to work with, or I, I don't want to send a, a negative message to the development community. Um, uh, on the other hand, I mean, this, this property does have a lot of strong attributes but it's got some challenges as well, and I do appreciate um, the applicants who are here today to be willing to work with that and to go through this process. But I, I do take the preservation of industrial land very seriously. Uh, there's some instances in the, in the city of St. Pete where I'm more willing to look at changing some of the uses in an industrial zoning because we're starting to see uh, new types of uses like art studios and so forth that um, could be, th they're establishing themselves as successful models of commerce in these areas and I can be, I, I can be persuaded to see where we might do some rezoning in those areas. But in this case, it's a little bit different and it kind of reminds me almost a little bit of my environmentalist days where we're trying to fight for green space because once green space is developed, you can, you can never get it back. And in this case, it's like once we lose industrially zoned land, um, I'm worried that we might not get it back. And first and foremost, number one, is I wanna see our city have better jobs and better paying jobs. And I'm not exactly, for me, a, a smaller number of lower paying jobs is not exactly a consolation prize for me. Um, and, and, and I'd also just kind of like to throw something out. I mean, this is looking further down the road, but I mean, this is adjacent to a water treatment plant. Um, there's been a lot of discussions about advanced uh, water treatment reuse of this water. It might sound like something brand spanking new and frankly maybe a little unappetizing uh, right now, but in 20 years from now, there could, it is not outside the realm of reason that we would have technology able to clean this water to uh, a level, a potable level, or a level certainly that could be used for some type of industrial processes and it would be right there, right next door. And maybe, although this area is far away from 275, um, maybe there would be other things that would make it conducive as a potential industrial area. And I just don't, I just don't wanna close the door on that forever. So um, I'm leaning towards, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be voting against this. I, I, do, um, I do want folks in the room to know that um, if this does come back to St. Petersburg and it looks like there's a very good chance that it will and that if DRC, um, if there's an appeal by either side, it will definitely be back in front of city council 
and then I am duty bound to, and I think it's coming back to city council in May anyway as quasi judicial, but I am duty bound um, to look at this with a fresh new set of eyes and to certainly give it um, um, the fairest consideration and I will respect the recommendation made by this board and the board of county commissioners as this winds forward. Um, but, but today um, I'm voting no, I just wanna hang on to this industrially zoned land, so. Thank you very much. Any other comments before we move to a, a vote? Madam Chair, if it's all right with you on this matter, I'd prefer to do a roll call vote just to get a clear count, please. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, so uh, do I hear a motion? Do I, I hear any approval. motion? Move approval. Second. Okay, so there's a motion to approve from Commissioner Long and uh, a second by Council Member Gabbard. And Tina, you'll do the roll call. Mayor Bujowski? Aye. Commissioner Gerard? No. Vice Mayor Albritton? Aye. Commissioner Smith? No. Mayor Cookie Kennedy? No. Commissioner Eggers? No. Vice Mayor Mers? No. Council Member Gabbard? Yes. Commissioner Seal? Commissioner Long? Yes. And Council Member Rice? No. Oh, we, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Council Member Noble? No. And that motion fails eight to four. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, really appreciate the thoughtful questions, the presentations, the hard work on this. Thank you, everyone who's here and who called in on Zoom. So that was um, that was a pretty long item, and uh, we're going a little bit over time that we normally do. So we're going to go straight to our next few action items. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, yes, yes. We're going to go. To, we're going to finish up the next land use case. Then we have a couple of more action items and uh, we'll see what else we can get through quickly. Um, so 6B4, KCW 21-07, Pinellas County. Hi, Nusheen. Hello again. I will try to make this one quick. Thank you for your time. Um, this case is CW 2107, submitted by Pinellas County. Next slide, please. The county seeks to amend properties from retail and services, employment, office, public, semi-public, residential low medium, recreation, open space, and preservation, all to the activity center and multimodal corridor category. And the proposed amendment would allow the application of the Largo Tri-City Special Area Plan to parcels in unincorporated Pinellas County. Next slide, please. The amendment area is included in the Largo Tri-City Special Area Plan with an area size of approximately 140.46 acres. That's an aggregate of all the involved parcels. Its existing uses are residential, retail, office, and recreation open space uses, with surrounding uses including residential, retail, and also recreation open space uses. Next slide, please. To provide context for this area, the Largo Tri-City Special Area Plan was approved by you as the Forward Pinellas Board back in October of 2020 and then adopted by the city in December 2020. And portions of the Special Area Plan include parcels in unincorporated county. And the Special Area Plan indicates that the plan will not apply to these unincorporated areas unless it is adopted by the county and then annexed into the city. So as such, the county and the city have adopted a resolution which indicates this um, county support for the city's implementation of of the special area plan and furthermore intends to facilitate the annexation of these parcels and as a note none of the uses of these already developed properties are going to be changing you're really just applying the activity center and multimodal corridor category to these parcels next slide please the next few images are just meant to give you an idea of the uses um, in this amendment area so first we have um, images of uses close to the intersection of U.S. Highway 19 North and Whitney Road. Next slide, please. Then we have some uses along Roosevelt Boulevard. Next slide, please. And then further along Roosevelt Boulevard, here's some more images. Next slide, please. 
So the map in front of you portrays the current countywide plan uh, map categories and the next few slides will just be going through the usual permitted uses and density and intensity standards of these categories. So first we have retail and services. Next slide please. And Sarah, you can kind of skip through these. So we have employment and office. Then we have the permitted uses for public semi-public. The permitted uses for residential low medium. And then the permitted uses for recreation, open space and preservation. And the next slides will go over the density and intensity standards of these same categories. So retail and services, employment and the map being shown to you is the same map on all of these slides. The office um, density and intensity standards. Public semi-public. Residential low medium. And then lastly, the recreation, open space and preservation categories. And as mentioned, um, these parcels are just being amended to the activity center and multimodal corridor category. So next slide, please. And this is shown on the map in front of you with the permitted uses for the activity center category and the density and intensity standards for the category. And this particular type of activity center is identified under the major activity center subcategory. Next slide, please. And then we have the multimodal corridor category and the permitted uses listed in front of you. And this particular multimodal corridor is identified as a primary corridor um, as the Largo Tri-City Special Area Plan is. Next slide, please. And one of the countywide considerations, as I'm sure you're aware, is the location of an amendment area on a coastal high hazard area. And portions of this amendment area, specifically to the east and north, are located on the CHHA. However, many of these areas have already been developed or are designated as preservation, and they're not expected to develop to higher densities. Moreover, once these parcels are annexed into the city of Largo, they will be prohibited from increasing in density per the city's comprehensive plan policies. And lastly, the special area plan addresses sustainability and resiliency in its analysis of their existing conditions, and they provide what we find to be appropriate recommendations for this. Next slide, please. Um, amendments to the activity center and multimodal corridor designation are also required to address the planning and urban design principles outlined in the countywide plan strategies. And the Largo uh, Tri-City Special Area Plan addressed this, and this was seen by you back in October of 2020 for the board members that were here. And we have just included these same principles again for the record. So first we have the first three principles. Next slide, please. And then we have the final three principles that they are required to address. Next slide, please. To conclude, this proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the activity center and multimodal corridor categories. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. Next slide, please. In front of you was an analysis of those relevant countywide considerations. Next slide, please. And lastly, there were no public comments received for this case concluding this presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's go to um, our public hearing and first ask for any proponents wishing to be heard. Sarah, do we have anyone in Zoom or in the room who wishes to speak? There are no proponents in the room. Any proponents in Zoom wishing to speak, please use the raise hand feature or star nine if you're calling on the phone at this time. There are no proponents. Great, thank you. Uh, Sarah, are there any opponents? We're now asking for any opponents either in the room or in Zoom who wish to be heard. There are no opponents in the room. Any opponents in Zoom wishing to speak at this time, please use the raise hand button or press star nine on the phone in Zoom. There are no opponents. Okay, thank you. And now we will hear from um, any other citizens in the room. Sarah, is there anyone in the room or in Zoom who wishes to speak? There are no other citizens in the room. Any other citizens wishing to speak in Zoom, please use the raise hand button at this time or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. Right. 
there is no one wishing to speak on this item. Great. Thank you very much. And with that, we will close the public hearing. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Yes, Vice Mayor Mers. <clears throat> oh, Vice Mayor, could you? Sorry about that. Uh, just, just a clarification on number seven, uh, the reservation of industrial land as a, as a follow up to the last. The last line says that the proposed amendment will reserve the current employment and industrial capacity of the relevant parcels in the amendment area. So there's no real change then, if I read that right. Correct. They're not actually changing any of the uses. This is just applying this category to become part of the special area plan submitted by Largo. Okay. And from the, the drawing here, it's, it's obviously lots of little pieces all yes. around as opposed to an individually large size. Road yes. About last time. Okay. In the slide where I provided the area context, that shows the entire um, amendment area for the Largo special area plan. These parcels are just the unincorporated parcels. Okay. I see. Thank you for that clarification. Sure. Do we hear a motion? Motion, motion to approve. Okay, I, di I didn't quite hear who made the motion. Motion to approve. Uh, okay, motion to approve from Commissioner Michael Smith and the second is from Commissioner Seal. For approval? For approval of the amendment. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, we want to try to get through our next few items pretty quickly. I'm going to skip ahead to 7C, which is the PPC and MPO audits. This is an action item that needs our vote today. Just one second. I'm going to promote the auditors so that they can, can speak as well as uh, the other members wishing to speak at this time. Okay. Good afternoon. First, I'd like to start by thanking the board of directors and the staff of Fort Pinellas for having us here today to present the results of the 2020 audit. Without their assistance, we couldn't have gotten to this point. So today we're here to present the results of our audits of the Pinellas Planning Council and the Pinellas County Metropolitan Planning Organization. We are very pleased to report that we are ready to issue, we have issued unmodified opinions on both of these audits. Basically with an unmodified opinion, that's a clean opinion. Under that, the financial statements are presented in all material respects in accordance with the proper financial reporting framework. As part of our audit, we rely on assistance of management to get the information we need. We had full cooperation from management of the organization and full access to the books and records that we needed to perform our audit. Additionally, we had no disagreements with management over any accounting matters. And performing our audit, we followed generally accepted auditing standards. Now, the objective of these standards is reasonable, not absolute assurance that the financial statements are free from material misstatement. So what this means is that in performing our audit, we do not look at every single transaction that happened during the year but we perform tests of those transactions, tests of significant transaction classes in order to come up to a determination on whether those areas are properly presented. Basically, in following generally accepted auditing standards, we ensure that the accuracy, consistency, and verifiability of our procedures is consistent across anybody else that would do the same procedures. Additionally, this audit was performed in accordance with governmental auditing standards. Now, based on the governmental audit standards, we also test that the organization is in compliance with the laws, the regulations, any contracts and any other grant agreements that might affect the entity. So looking at this, again, we are not gonna look at every single transaction, every single aspect. We look at what we consider to be the significant aspects of those, you know, those significant laws that affect the financial reporting results. And additionally, under following governmental auditing standards, we are required as an auditing firm to go through, to have certain certifications, basically experience and knowledge related to governmental auditing in order to perform these jobs. We are very pleased to report that we meet those requirements. 
Um, again, this is the general overall audit approach, looking at the overall audit. Now to get into a little bit more detail, I'm gonna pass it over to Julie Davis, who worked as the audit manager on this audit and went through a lot of the detailed tests related to the job. Thanks, Chris. Um, for the record, I'm Julie Davis. I'm a senior audit manager with Rivera Cordemer and Company, and I'm responsible for overseeing the day-to-day -day process of the audit. Um, kind of taking over the presentation here, as part of our audit, we're also required to do what's called a federal single audit or an audit in accordance with uniform guidance. And that's specifically related to the MPO's federal funds that you all receive from US DOT as well as Florida DOT. Uh, we're pleased to report that we had no findings of compliance um, in accordance with the federal single audit. Um, further down, we were required as part of our financial statement audit to look at internal controls. Um, we had no material weaknesses noted for the PPC or reportable findings um, on the PPC. For the MPO, we did have a material weakness that was included in our reports. Um, the material weakness was due to a prior period restatement of an over accrual of an expense between the MPO and the PPC. Um, the definition of a material weakness is that a material misstatement would not be caught and corrected within, in a timely manner. Uh, the error was found after the 2019 audit was already completed, so we concluded that it was not found timely. Good news is, is that your staff, along with CLA, found the error and corrected it long before we were even engaged as your auditors. Um, however, it does meet the standard of material weakness, so it's more of a um, we have to report it type of thing. Moving on, we have other matters that were required to report to the governing body. Um, this is the fun page of we have nothing to report to you. So in the essence of time, I will skip past this page. But good news, no fraud, no illegal acts, nothing else to report to you all. And then finally is an overall financial summary of the MPO and the PPC. Um, due to the timing of how long everything took today, I'll kind of save you all the details here. But overall, the assets of both entities remained relatively consistent year over year. The liabilities did change slightly related to the MPO, and that was mainly due to that prior period misstatement um, that was adjusted. These numbers are not adjusted 2019 numbers, they actually match the audit financial statements. And overall, the net positions of both entities remained relatively consistent year over year. The statement of activities is your net, is basically your income statement for the year. The planning council ended the year with a change in net position of a deficit of three, about 327,000, and the MPO ended the year at 126,000 to the positive. Um, these changes are consistent year over year um, ever since the implementation of the pension standard. Um, it's pretty in-depth conversation for the pension related items, but those are the main items that causes the MP or the PPC to have negative numbers each year. I know we went over this really quick um, in the essence of time, but I would like to pause for any questions. With that, I'd like to thank everyone at Forward Pinellas, as well as CLA, as well as you all as the governing body for selecting us as your auditor this year. Um, and with that, we'll let you close out the meeting. Yeah, and I also just want to add thank you again for selecting us, as Julie mentioned. And if at any time anybody has a question, we are always available to answer those questions. Thank you. And thank you very much. So do we have any more questions or comments? We'll Seeing none, we'll check with Sarah. Sarah, are there any members of the public in the room or in Zoom who wish to speak on the audits? There are no members of the public in the room wishing to speak on this. Any members of the public in Zoom wishing to speak on this item, please use the raise hand button at this time or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. There are no members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Thank you. Do I hear a motion for approval? Move approval. Um, so motion second. for approval from Dave Eggers and a second from Mayor Kennedy. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Commissioner Gerard. It was, it was a female voice somewhere <laughs> over there. <laughs> okay. Um, 
All in favor, say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Great. This passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll move on. And, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, 7D, the resolution supporting Safe Streets Pinellas Action Plan. Uh, Sarah Caper. Thank you. Good afternoon, board members. Uh, today we're going to be discussing, as mentioned, the Safe Streets Pinellas Action Plan and a resolution supporting it. Safe Streets Pinellas is our Vision Zero effort. As um, all of you know, Vision Zero is a different way about thinking about transportation safety and a philosophy and approach to that. And these are some of the major tenets of Vision Zero communities. They relate to leadership and commitment, safe roadways and safe speeds, and then using a data-driven approach with transparency, accountability, and reevaluating on a regular basis. Equity is another major component of Vision Zero. And why we've been working on Vision Zero and Safe Streets Pinellas in Pinellas County, as you can see here, on average, two people are killed or severely injured every day in collisions. And we know that these collisions in particular impact our vulnerable roadway users, our bicyclists, our pedestrians, and our motorcyclists. As part of the development of the action plan, which is something we've been working on for the past year or so, we have an extensive action plan that results in these major elements of actions in the categories shown before you right now. For each of these actions, we have a time frame, responsible partners that we want to work with, and also performance measures so we can evaluate our progress. And then finally, a little bit more on implementation of the action plan. We've been working over the past month or so to develop templates and start working on what we might do first after the board takes action on the action plan. After you do, and the resolution supporting zero deaths and serious injuries by 2045, we will reach out to our partner agencies and the local governments to promote the adoption of Safe Streets Pinellas and to support a working group, which is one of those initial actions. And we'll keep working on that and some of the other first year elements through the spring and the rest of the year, including having the first meeting of that working group. I know I went through this very quickly, um, but I'm happy to take any questions you have on the action plan. And um, you can also look at the website. We have some videos and other information on the website. Thanks, Sarah. Do we have any questions from the board? Okay. If I can just mention real quick, you may have seen the editorial today in Tampa Bay Times about dangers by design. So we, we, we do have a problem here, and I think we've got a, a very focused approach to bring our partners together to address safety. So I'm pleased with this work, and um, I think we've got a strategic action plan going forward. Very good, very good. Any other comments? Uh, Sarah, do we have anyone in the room or in Zoom who wishes to speak to this item? We have no one in the room wishing to speak on this. Anyone in Zoom wishing to speak on this at this time, please use the raise hand button in Zoom or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. There's no one wishing to speak on this item. Thank you very much. Do I hear a motion to adopt the resolution supporting Safe Streets Pinellas Action Plan? So we have, um, that's moved by Vice Mayor Albritton and the- Commissioner Gerard. And Commissioner Gerard is our second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, I mean, I know I'm very much looking forward to hearing the updates and discussion for 7E and 7F, uh, but I think we're all getting maybe a little bit tired. It's getting long. And in that spirit, if that's okay with Commissioners Long and Commissioner Seal, do you mind if we skip through the PSTA and T-BARTA reports unless there's something really burning? Okay, it looks like we can um, move on to the director's report. Thank you very much, and I will be very brief. Um, I do wanna uh, recognize Jensen Hackett uh, here from the Florida Department of Transportation. Commissioner Eggers called me and I've received other comments from many others uh, 
in recent weeks about some of the safety measures taken on US 19 north around uh, Curlew Road, just south of Curlew Road. And Jensen has some information about that that he'd like to just briefly address. And I think we've got some images on the screen to help orient people. This will take just a minute. So we can get those images up. There's an aerial and then some photographs, maybe. Go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Whit. Um, so this is, I'm just going to discuss quickly um, the uh, safety change that we've made to US 19 northbound, uh, just south of Curlew Road at the intersection of 297th Avenue North. Um, several serious injury crashes have occurred at this location that actually triggered a safety study of the area through our traffic ops team at District 7. Uh, the study revealed an average of about 12 serious injury crashes per year with nearly 20 that occurred just in the last year and that was um, late 2019 through uh, the summer of 2020. Due to the results of this study, two alternatives have been proposed to alleviate the safety concern at that intersection. The first was closing the US-19 southbound ramp um, or left turn lane into 297th Avenue North. And the second was placing the delineators to create a right turn only lane into 297th Avenue while keeping the right turn lane only at Curlew just to the north. The delineators were chosen um, over the closing of the southbound left-hand turn lane due to the creation of weaving conflicts at the southbound turn lane into Northside Drive, as well as to not restrict access into the residential areas along 297th. The residential area that stems from Northside has no connectivity to the residential area along 297th, which would create a conflict area where those needing to make a U-turn at Northside would then need to weave across all four lanes to turn right onto 297th. Because of this, it was the best option in order to correct the injury crashes occurring at the intersection and to allow for the continued access to 297th that the current safety change be kept as is. We've worked with PSTA in order to provide adequate room for PSTA buses at the bus stop just to the south of this location and the bus stop north of that location. We've also worked to improve traffic operations and traffic flow along the northbound corridor since this change went into effect late last year. We've increased signage to vehicles noting that the right turn only designation ahead, increasing that signage to nearly 2,000 feet to the south of the intersection, which was completed in December of 2020. We've also placed new uh, delineators on the northeast corner, which are the yellow ones in that image there, um, to stop vehicles from jumping through that bike lane to kind of weave between the delineators and that uh, street light pole that's there. Um, that was actually completed in January of 21. And then we've also placed reflective striping on all signage uh, to enhance visibility of the uh, right lane must turn right and the uh, turn lane there. And that was actually completed last week um, in March of 21. As a reminder, this is a temporary change and condition to the northbound lanes of US 19. This area is part of the US 19 reconstruction that will take place from just north of Countryside uh, to north of the Curlew intersection, um, which will include obviously the mainline and frontage road system similar to the US 19 alignment to the south. This construction project is set to let in February of 22. Um, so this safety change actually will only be in place for about another 10 months until that construction does begin as part of that project. So. If you have any questions, I know that was a quick run through, but um, if you have any questions, I would love to answer them now. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, could you keep that picture up on the screen, please? Uh, I, I'm just, I've got so many people call me about how confusing this is. You know, you're flying along 19, and that's what you're trying to do, move traffic. There's many other intersections south of there that don't have this. So how does this help anything because you're I, I was thinking in my mind that the folks that come out of there if they're going to turn right at least you're going to have protected them from the south coming northward there like so they could turn right into the lane but you're not even allowing that they're having to get out into the remaining three or the remaining three lanes and they're not even going to be able to use that lane until they get out around that bulb so what are you actually accomplishing here um, and from a safety perspective, I, I just don't get it. So the original safety concern was if you look to the left-hand side of the screen, that's the southbound turn lane into 297. Right. And what we were seeing happen was the three lanes on the left side um, were actually queuing up to the signal that is at Curlew in US 19. And a lot of people by this point have already merged over into those lanes because obviously that right lane dropped at Curlew and was a right turn only. So what was happening is we were watching, um, we've got a traffic camera 
just to the south of this intersect or this location. Um, so we were watching motorists in the three lanes to the left start waving people over from that southbound um, left-hand turn lane. And by the time they got to the right lane, they couldn't see around the traffic and gunned it. And they actually were getting T-bone there at that location. Um, and that's why we did the safety study, which saw 12 on average serious injury crash at, those, at this location with 20 occurring between 2019 and 2020. So that's why we did this change. And the reason why we put the delineators to the north side of this is to deter motorists from using um, the right turn lane as well as the bike lane to weave around this and cause an issue to kind of get in front of those traffic that would be turning right from 297. So that's why we put the delineators on the north side as well to deter that traffic from trying to round it around onto the bike lane. I, I just don't, I mean, I still don't understand. I mean, I, I, whether it's three lanes or four lanes, you're going to have a problem at some point. So you're just choosing an arbitrary fourth lane as the, I mean, you got some problems. You had some accidents and that kind of thing. But when you're turning right out of that street, it, you, you're not allowing them to merge onto the traffic, uh, onto that right lane. That would be the perfect merge area to, to if you're going to do this, if you're going to stop that right hand lane from going through it would be great to let them just turn the people coming out of that street i don't i mean again you're you're forcing them into the remaining three lanes that's what you're doing right yeah and i can i can take this back to our traffic ops to see if there could be tweaks that could be made in this interim condition for the next 10 months so i'm more than happy to do that thank you for 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 the report this afternoon just so you know my assistant says it's been wonderful <laughs> she lives there she lives there yeah yeah and it's been great it's really helped. That's why we had Jensen stick around that long to hear that compliment. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like I was up here minutes ago, but it was actually like, you know, days at this point. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Jensen. Thank you. Uh, board, I'm not going to cover the other items in here just to let you know that there is a letter in your correspondence outlining some interim improvements on US 19 at uh, Gandhi Park Boulevard that we've worked out with the. Uh, the city of Pinellas Park, and we've requested uh, funding from the Department of Transportation to address those. Um, I'm optimistic that that'll happen. Um, 34th Street South, we're going to come back to you in a couple of months with a request to maybe look at a PD&E corridor study to really deal with all the things we need to in that complete street area. And then I just wanted to let you know for the board discussion of the frontage roads, uh, we have decided to uncouple that from the Innovative Intersections workshop we're going to have later in the year. So in uh, May, we will have a presentation from the department on the frontage road plan, and then they will come back to you probably in July for approval of the frontage roads plan. So that's going to be two opportunities to look at frontage roads. Okay, and then if I can just folks. go on to the legislative committee, um, the committee met this morning and asked us to write uh, letters of opposition to the bill concerning the rectangular rapid flashing beacon law that came back from last year, and also to write a letter of opposition to House Bill 55, which includes the prohibition of design standards for single and duplex housing, uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, which would be a real Darn. barrier to integrating yeah. infill development into homes. So, I think we, one, two, three, four, five, may have lost our quorum. We do not have a quorum, so sorry. I, I just, thought, what happened to Cliff? <laughs> well, that's only six, so he's still. Uh, yeah. we need, I, I don't think I need seven. your action to send these letters because they are consistent with the policy priorities you've already adopted. But the legislative committee made that recommendation. In previous years, and we did that. No, yes, you adopted and, and the priorities this year. Well, then what, why, did, why did we talk about it? I thought this was the last year so that we did send the letters. Already. Last year we sent a letter, yeah. but you've already adopted priority legislative position statements, and these fall under those position statements largely, so I'm not too concerned about that, but we've got to act fast. And um, unless there's any real opposition. Um, I'm in favor of moving forward. Um, our colleagues knew this was on here. Um, they left, so... Um, this is important. We need to send this through. So I, I support so you moving forward. Thank you. Any questions for me? Yes. I got one question about Clearwater's Intermodal Center. <laughs> Everybody talked about left. it before. <laughs> and I don't want to drag this out anymore, but 
can we get a support letter from Ford Pinellas on that and just to say that it is on the priority list and for, for PSTA, just, not for Clearwater. Just so what everybody knows, there is a, a build grant uh, notice of funding availability pending uh, that, that was originally issued by the previous administration. The current administration in Washington uh, is tweaking the criteria and will be releasing that in coming weeks. Uh, PSTA has let us know that they will be submitting an application for the Downtown Clearwater Intermodal Center. I have also heard that Pinellas County is considering an application for the Dunedin Causeway Bridges. Um, my position, and I've conveyed this to Pinellas County administration, is that it is a, a, a bad message to try and send two applications from one county for this very highly competitive grant. Uh, and um, we, we've never won one of these grants before. We've submitted for the Pinellas Trail about three times. Uh, PSTA submitted a grant last year and was unsuccessful. Pinellas County also submitted one for the Dunedin Causeway Bridges last year and was also unsuccessful. After last year, I said, I'm not gonna do that again. We're just gonna support one grant application from the county. In my, and that's, you know, that's me as a staff saying that, so if you all disagree, then that's certainly board policy if you wanted to do that. Um, I suspect we'll have another meeting before the notice of funding availability is issued, so we can maybe take it up at the April meeting. But the, the downtown intermodal center is on our priority list. The Dunedin Causeway Bridges is in our TIP, but only by virtue of being on the county's capital improvement program, and it is not on our priority list. So um, by that measure, I would send a letter of support to PSTA for the downtown intermodal center. It fits better with our overall emphasis on equity uh, and multimodal transportation. Um, I think the Dunedin Causeway bridges are needed, but you know I would also say we need the San Martin Bridge and we need the Beckett Bridge. And I would hear from my St. Pete colleagues as, as well if we weren't advancing the San Martin Bridge. So um, just to let you know where I stand on that, um, I'm open to any direction that you all would like to give me today, but I think we can take it up in the next meeting if you'd like to have a further discussion. Yes. And I do have a meeting on Tuesday with um, Jill Silverboard and Barry Burton to talk about this. And those, those, those bridge uh, projects may be better suited for the uh, sustainability money that's gonna be coming out for um, transportation. And, and, and there is federal money that does not flow through the MPO process for bridge replacement, especially when bridges become structurally deficient. This bridge is not yet structurally deficient, is my understanding, and but within maybe five years or so, it'll be approaching its useful life and 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 maybe at that position, and and it also could be something that we seek stimulus funding for as well. Well, Commissioner Long brought it up last night, and we're she forwarded us a letter. We didn't get a chance to talk about it yet, but we will. Okay. That's all I have today. Okay. Well, in that case, um, I think we're ready to adjourn. Okay. Yes, we're gonna, we got a second on that. Thank you so much. We're going to wrap up our meeting. Thank you all for your patience and um, your service. Thank you.